subject. Um, so I'd like to talk about pedagogy. And I'd like especially to uh, focus on, well, two, uh, shall we say, uh, opposite perspectives on pedagogy. First of all, you have the perspective offered by, by Plato, which you can sort of like uh, uh, glean from uh, his two large books, The Republic, which he wrote in the middle of his, his life, and uh, Laws, which he wrote at the end of his life, his very long life. It's an unusually long life. He died at more or less at the age of 80. And uh, you can glean from that his uh, pedagogical uh, philosophies, educational uh, you know, strategies, and so forth and so on. And uh, in Plato's case, I mean, these things were hardly theoretical. They were actual, they were operational. They were operational in his school, in the school that he founded in Athens, the Athenium. Well, it's a small trivia matter. It's, it's from the Athenium that Ateneo get, it gets its name. Uh, the, uh, the, the famous school that he began in, uh, in Athens. Uh, because uh, no such uh, establishment used to exist in education in Athens. In the Athens into which he was born was uh, a matter of uh, personal initiative on the part of parents. There were no city uh, or state uh, sponsored schools so what education uh, anyone received was really the result of the parents uh, of the young people hiring for example these teachers for hire uh, called uh, the sophists uh, who for a consideration of money it's, let's say 30 pieces of silver uh, if they uh, thought that was enough money they would uh, in a sense become the employees of parents who pay the money, so forth and so on. So it was sort of like homeschooling uh, in Athens, private education, and so forth and so on. And Plato some saw that it was an extremely, uh, well, just wrong, just wrong. Because, I mean, when, when parents are in charge of education, uh, in, in private education, homeschooling, and so forth and so on, uh, you know, you don't end up educating your children for the objectives of the city, for the common good, but you do so for uh, sectoral, tribal, family, vested interests, and so forth and so on. And so to uh, prove it, I mean, to, so, to, to kind of show the way to a different future, he started his school. But we'll talk about it in a while. So on the one hand, we have the Athenium, which he, uh, which he began in Athens. Uh, and uh, you know, in which he operated his educational philosophies, educational strategies, and so forth and so on. And then on the uh, on the opposite end, you have the education as we have it in our own society, which Michel Foucault. That's another work that we shall his works, his latter works, we shall take into consideration. Uh, the education operational in what Michel Foucault calls the disciplinary society or disciplinary civilization. Now. Uh, Bishop Ho was not uh, a, uh, a fan of uh, the disciplinary civilization. I mean, he's not a, uh, an unthinking, unreflective sort of a fan. But he precisely, uh, uh, you know, describes it, and he describes it wonderfully well and accurately, although he's not the first person to do that. Most philosophers uh, have critical uh, points to make about uh, what... Foucault calls disciplinary society, what other philosophers call the technological society, the scientific society, the uh, contemporary society, and so forth and so on. Many, many other writers, many other in, in, from different fields have made critical remarks concerning such a society. And uh, so in a sense, uh, Foucault, by uh, making his own presentation, is not saying anything new, although the way he says it is, of course, uh, very uh, attention-drawing. You know? I mean, he has a very uh, uh, interesting way of putting things, etc., etc. So, uh, but but the, the point is that what his points concerning the discipline of society, which you find, for example, in the book Discipline and Punish, and the History of Sexuality, Volume One, those two books together uh, comprise more or less the critical interrogation that Foucault makes of discipline of society. Um, you know, towards the end of his life. But you know, uh, what differentiates him from other philosophers is simply do that also. 
his other philosophers are quick to, uh, so let's say, they make their critical points and then they offer solutions. So even philosophers like Levinas, Martin Buber, Gabriel Marcel, uh, you know, the philosophers you mostly study and so forth and so on, they're very uh, aggressive and quick to propose solutions, which Foucault does not. Because his point is, and maybe it's a wisdom that he learned from the Greeks, and it's a wisdom encapsulated in uh, the Lord's exhortation to us, Jesus' exhortation, to, and, and of course, he, after all, Jesus is incarnated into a Greek-Roman Jewish culture. So, in other words, whatever he said, Plato and Aristotle and the Jewish uh, philosophers and theologians, etc., said first, except maybe the revelation that he was the Son of God. But everything else was not really original, you know. It's... Uh, that's what it means to believe in the incarnation. Jesus was incarnated into a specific culture which had all these traditions and all these perspectives, etc., etc. And this Jesus encapsulates a perspective which was all around, which is in the air, when he says, for example, you know, love your enemies as yourself. In other words, if you're not comfortable with yourself, if you're not comfortable living under your own skin, well, how can you expect to love your enemies? So that's a chronological sequence. First, become comfortable. Come home to roost in yourself first. And then you stand the chance of loving your enemies. Or he also says, do not pay attention to the speck in your brother's eye. First, pay attention to the log jam in your own eye. Pay attention to yourself. Care for yourself. So in other words, that's what differentiates Foucault from uh, you know, people like Levinas, people like Habermas, you know, etc., etc., who are very quick to propose solutions. But, you know, in the case of all of them, all their solutions, why is the world in such a bad way despite all the wonderful solutions proposed? Obviously, these uh, uh, people were well-meaning, but they, they misunderstood the point. They were not attending to the fact that, you know, simply because they had not looked into themselves, they had not made proper discernments as to what in themselves had to be reformed, had to be modified, maybe even rejected and replaced, etc., etc. They ended up being, becoming part of the problem. They ended up in themselves jinxing the solutions, the very solutions they proposed. And so, as a result, we have a world today which uh, is really not an improvement over past worlds. We have a world today which, if anything, is getting worse. When only when 1% of the world owns 80% of the world's resources, I mean, it cannot be a good world. But, but that's the tragedy of our world. We don't, we don't listen to Foucault, and in that sense, we don't listen to Plato also. After all, Foucault's uh, proposals, in a sense, are very much Plato and Aristotle, and the, and, and the philosophers of antiquity. They're, they're perspectives, and pay attention to yourself. Care for yourself before anything else. So that's what, in a sense, uh, Foucault in his philosophy, and particularly you find, you, you begin to find the, the way forward that he proposes in the book called The Use of Pleasure, and in The Care of the Self, and in cognate the uh, lectures that he gave at the Collège de France, uh, at which he was based for all of his life, except uh, maybe for one year in which he served in a philosophy department in Finland, except for that one year. The rest of his uh, career was spent working out of the Collège de France, a state-sponsored institution for researchers, sort of like a house of writers. Although, you know, it's not really only a house. If you go to see the, the complex, it's really a magnificent, huge complex with many buildings and so forth and so on. So, uh, in any case, uh, that's what Foucault says. So, what we'll basically do is, uh, I'll say a few words, uh, something about Plato, which I'm sure most of you will be familiar with already. Say something about it as comprising an educational philosophy, which uh, unfortunately we uh, hardly ever pay any attention to uh, these days, as if we ever did pay any attention to it. And uh, Foucault's sort of like rehabilitation of that which we do not pay attention to. Basically say what Plato had said, care for yourself. If you want to become the king of all, first learn to become the slave of all. Enter into yourself to learn to become the slave of all. 
and of course you should something similar if you want to become the master of all you first have to learn this to become the servant of all okay so uh, so let, let, let's begin with uh, a few things uh, about Plato's educational philosophy you know what one of the most unfortunate things uh, in relation to Plato is the fact that uh, he basically is classed by most people and is taught by most people maybe even taught by you because you it was learned by you that way he, Plato very often is taught as a utopian, as a metaphysical philosopher. As uh, you know, very he makes some very interesting points, you know, to fill up fill up a dull afternoon. But it's not very practical, we say. Well, that's a very wrong interpretation of Plato. That's why we have, uh, you know, uh, we we are in the habit of dismissing him. You know that interpretation of Plato must have originated uh, with Saint Augustine, who, after all, introduced uh, Plato into the Catholic Church. But Saint Augustine could never have read Plato in the original. After all, Saint Augustine lived in a big town in Africa, a small town. You know, and of course, the Plato books were not readily available. So the only contact he must have had with Plato were through the Neoplatonists, not Plato, the Neoplatonists. Now, when you see the word neo attached to anything, it usually means these people distort the philosophy of the original person. So, in other words, we uh, we have an interpretation of Plato that is a legacy of Augustine reading the Neoplatonists, and maybe also goaded by the earlier sort of like uh, wrong, uh, really. Uh, uh, how, how should I put it? Uh, the, uh, you know, I, there's a story about uh, this old man, you know, he was at the point of death. And he received a friend, you know, who was visiting. And this friend asked him, in your life, is there anything, now that uh, maybe you don't have too long to live now, is there anything that uh, you regret having done, you re regret very much? And the old man on his sick bed, on his deathbed, he, he thought for a while and he said, yeah, perhaps it was the fact that when I was a child playing with other children, we, uh, we were playing around the signpost, you know, leading to our village. And you know, the signpost said, if you go this way, you go, you're going to end up there. If you go that way, you're going to end up there. But what we did as little children is we turned the signpost. And now that I'm about to die, I have sort of begun to wonder how many travelers have I sent the wrong way as a result? How many travelers have I misled? So in other words, in a, in a sense, Aristotle himself misleads. He misled travelers into Plato's territory. Simply from a few remarks, a few paragraphs, you know, that you can find in the Nicomachean Ethics, he calls Plato precisely the, a friend of the forms, a metaphysician, completely useless for living. But you know, Aristotle, as I keep telling people, uh, did that only because he was resentful. He was resentful over the fact that when Plato died, he was, he fully expected to be named by the colleagues of Plato the successor head of the academy. But the thing is, he was not. Well, I can understand why. I mean, his reaction, you know, his reaction was, okay, he, I, I, I haven't been elected president, I'm going to leave the academy. So he left the Athenium. He started his own school, the Lyceum, the Peripatetic School. And from that point on, he bad-mouthed Plato. And of course, Plato could no longer say anything, could no longer defend himself, because he was already dead. You know, so in other words, that famous painting that you see of uh, Aristotle and Plato walking down the corridors of the Athenium with, uh, by Raphael, you know, there's people around them and they're walking down the corridor at the center with Plato pointing up to heaven and Aristotle pointing down to the earth. Well, it's a very, um, uh, very nice painting, but as an interpretation of Plato, it is completely wrong. I, I, I cannot overemphasize that point. Plato was not a metaphysician. He was not a friend of the forms. He was a very concrete urban planner. And you, you can know that simply by reading the Republic and the Laws, which he wrote at the end of his life. He was, in, in both books, he was very concerned about concrete detail. And when he, for example, in the Allegor of the Cave, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, the cave. The, the cave, you can interpret, it's a womb. The cave is a womb. And what is a womb? 
it's a it's a it's an environment in which we begin life. So Plato was not talking about uh, a cave which was like uh, a veil of tears only, as we have it in our prayer, the hell Holy Queen. But he was talking about a cave as a womb, a source of life. So that was Plato. In other words, he was intending to give a more positive interpretation. You know, this is the world in which, it's the only world in which we live. There are no two worlds. There's no... It, the, the phrase two world theory does not occur anywhere in Plato. I don't know how that phrase originated. And yet it's what we constantly hear from our own professors and what we perhaps uh, mislead our own students into believing about Plato, that he taught a two world theory. That he taught that there was a world beyond this world and so forth and so on. No, it's, so the first thing you have to get rid of when uh, you, you take these points that I'm present it to you for your consideration, is get rid of the very bad habit of simply assuming that Plato was a metaphysician. Because he was not. He was not a philosopher who thought about things above the merely physical, the merely temporal. And the temporal and the physical are not merely, merely. This is not only the front porch to eternity, it is the scene of our lives. And Plato was interested in precisely talking about the scene of our lives, the scene of our living, the venue of our living. Okay, so uh, I was saying to you earlier, the reason why, uh, let, let's talk about Plato's education philosophy first of all, before we make a presentation concerning uh, Foucault's thoughts on the matter. So, uh, so you have, uh, you have Plato, you know, sort of like being born into the, he was actually born in the city, into the city of Athens. Born into a prominent family. In fact, one of the families that comprised the oligarchy of Athens, you know, when he was born into it. Now, Athens, as you know, was, did not start out as an oligarchy. It started out as a democracy. It started out because uh, Plato's uh, forebears, you know, people like Solon and Pericles and so forth, you can more or less develop a history of Athens simply by googling for the history of ancient Athens. They, their generation had this idea that, you know, why don't we experiment with uh, a uh, system of politics in which uh, uh, you uh, would have the governance of the people rather than the governance of potentates. That was the beginnings of the democracy. But in order to give the, the practice of democracy a chance, you know, in view of the fact that uh, all the political arrangements around were despotic, they decided to build their city on a hill far away from the wharf town of Athens, the Piraeus. And so what they did is they, you know, usually when you build a city, you build it near the water, right? It's easier. Like uh, the city of Manila grew around, uh, well, they built first the Tramuros, right by the water, the edge of the water. And the city grew around it. And uh, all our cities are near a river, Pasig, uh, Mandaluyong, and so forth. They're near, uh, near bodies of water because uh, bodies of water are excellent conveyances of commercial uh, exchange. But the <coughs> experimenters with the democracy realized that uh, you cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. You cannot serve the democracy and mammon at the same time. They, 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 that's what they believed. And so they decided to build their city on a hill far away from the commercial center. And to uh, uh, assign the work of... Uh, getting profit out of commercial exchanges, assigned it to foreigners living within their territory, and these foreigners would actually do the commercial transactions and merely send the profits up to the inhabitants of the city on the hill. That was the idea. And the inhabitants of the city of the hill, the proper citizens of Athens, would uh, preoccupy themselves with only one kind of activity, and that was agricultural. 
and in other words, they wanted to make sure that the, e everything the citizens did, the citizens of Athens had to do with land, land which because they were connected to it, because they worked it and made living things come out of it and so forth and so on, they would feel responsible for, responsible enough for it in order to defend it in a time of war. So that was the idea. And so they built their city on this hill, 10 miles away from the Piraeus, separated from the Piraeus by a wilderness. So that was the thing. But you know, that was maybe 300 years, 400 years before Plato was born. In the meantime, the commercial uh, habits of the Piraeus crept up the hill, distorting the original commitment to democracy. And uh, by some kind of political alchemy, turning the democracy into an oligarchy, the rule of the first families. Now, Plato was born into one of the first families. So he had def definitely, as a member of the first family, he had insider information. And he didn't like what he saw. What he saw was an Athens in decline. Because of the oligarchy, Athens was in a period of decline. What he probably did not know was that the decline was irreversible. It would be a matter of a few decades uh, more before uh, the uh, Greek city-states would get gobbled up by the Roman Empire. And the Greek city-states were not in any position to defend themselves against the Roman Empire, which at the same time it gobbled up the Greek world, it gobbled up also. Uh, the Jewish world, etc., etc. Exactly the time of our work. And uh, one of the things that Plato felt that uh, were one of the contributing factors to decline was to the decline was uh, the lack of public education, as I told you. Education was arranged uh, was a sort of like the responsibility of parents, you know, hired these traveling teachers as office, you know to educate their children for family objectives. Not for the objectives of the city, not for the common good, but precisely for only private good. The good of the family, the good of the tribe, the good of a sector. So he saw, you know, thinking about the matter, you know, Plato understood that the, this is what, education was for profit, education was, self, was for self-promotion. So he wanted to be able to demonstrate that education could be turned to other purposes. And so for example, in uh, book one of the Republic, I mean, he insists to Thrasymachus who had said, you know, you're a fool, you're, you're crazy, Socrates, but well, you're not born yesterday. You know full well that education, that justice, because Plato, uh, in and through the character Socrates, was interested in justice. And so the, the, the question that Plato constantly, Socrates, was made to constantly ask was, what is justice? And this sophist Thrasymachus, who was in the dialogue, I mean, this is not the actual dialogue, because first of all, the cast of characters was comprised of people who lived in various times, you know, during the Greek era, etc., etc. So this is entirely Plato's uh, uh, creation, shall we say. But the reason he includes these people in particular in his dialogue is because they all uh, represented a particular perspective or idea that uh, was very important in Athenian, in Greek history, Athenian history. So anyway, Thrasymachus was one of those people, and he was a sophist. He represented the sophist position. And he says to Socrates, don't you know that justice is only the advantage of the stronger? Now Socrates, uh, in well, first of all, he allows uh, for a few minutes, for example, to, to pass before he says anything. He allows Socrates, uh, Thrasymachus rather to vent. And then, then when the dust had cleared, he said something which is also very true. But the stronger, don't they sometimes make a mistake concerning their advantage? Now, of course, in recent history, we know that to be the case. Ferdinand Marcos, Joseph Estrada, GMA, you know, I mean, there's no president that has not made a mistake. 
and has not paid for it. Don't the stronger sometimes make a mistake in really concerning their advantage. And so it's now for Simon his turn to fall silent because, I mean, how can you refute that? Which gives Socrates a chance to come in again and he says, well, therefore, we can teach the stronger not to make mistakes or at least to minimize the mistakes they make. Justice, therefore, is something which we can teach. Rulership, and then he segues into the idea of justice being rulership. Rulership is something that is not inherited, it's not legacy, it's not an inheritance. It is something that can be taught. It's a craft. Rulership is a craft. And then he takes the example of two well-known crafts, the craft of uh, medicine and the craft of horsemanship. So he says, consider the craft of medicine. Of course, uh, you know, medicine is something that can be learned and therefore something can be taught. But take medicine into account. Who benefits from the practice of medicine? Is it the healer or the healed? <laughs> Then, of course, Thrasymachus has to say, well, of course, it's a heal. You know, it's uh, doctors are doctors precisely because they become the, the sort of conduit to a cure for those who are sick. And when they get healed, they benefit from the exercise by doctors of the craft. So that's irrefutable. And then horsemanship. Who benefits from the craft of horsemanship? Of course, all these horse caregivers or horse whisperers as they call them they they have to learn I mean to say there's a scientific way of grooming a horse of feeding a horse of uh, making sure that the horse uh, takes in a balanced diet and so forth and so on that the horse develops no cavities so who benefits from all that work is it the horsemen or the horses so it's the horses so in other words, on the basis of two examples that he gives of uh, crafts, and you can assume that all other crafts are the same way, the beneficiaries of the exercise of the craft are not the holders of the craft, the doers of the craft, but rather the clients of the craft. So the same thing with rulership. If rulership is a craft, if rulership is something that we taught then it must be that rulership is for service. Okay, so that's a very important point that Plato makes at the very start of Book One, of the Republic, in Book One. Rulership is a craft, the objective of which is to render service to the rule. So in other words, right away, Plato has a very different conception of service, of, or rather of rulership. Rulership not being domination, Rulership not being a uh, panka bossy, but rather rulership precisely as serving the rule. Now, what kind of uh, people, however, will be the sort of appropriate? kinds of people who would render to the rule, rulership as service. <clears throat> what he talks about, therefore, he talks about well, the noble dogs and then the guardians. What's interesting is that he defines, uh, well, he first talks about noble dogs. Who then, and then he segues into the subject of the guardians, the guardians being the noble dogs. But what's very interesting about his definition of the guardians, the noble dogs, is that they represent spirit. They represent passions. The idea being that precisely unless you are passionate about it, I mean, why would you want to exercise rulership as a service? Wouldn't it be much better if you exercise rulership as a dying, dying, to be That's That's easy. You don't have to do anything, you just command. But in other words, if on the other hand you have this idea of rulership as service, well, you have to feel passionately enough about it to want to get off your butt 
in order to serve, in order to do things that will uh, amount to the service of others. So, therefore, that's, that's very interesting that he defines the first, the, the, the sort of the in, internal, the interior disposition of the guardians as a combination of passions. And then he uh, talks about the education of the guardians in terms of the cultivation of passions. So that's a pedagogy of the Athenian. Cultivate passions. I want you to teach your guardians, first of all, first of all, they're very young. They're taken from their families at the age of eight. So Plato insists you have to take them away from family influence. And his uh, suggestion is you, you get them to live in dormitories, away from their parents, starting with the age of eight. And of course, you don't take everyone. You only take those who you believe have the aptitude to have some potential talent in them be developed. You know, some people just don't have the talent. He understood that. Plato understood that a city is made up of different people with different or different folks who have different strokes. You know, Plato was very. Uh, he was very conscious of the fact that, you know, one of the first, uh, uh, shall we say, values of democracy, of a democracy, is uh, to acknowledge the uh, presence of plurality. So even in the Republic, he talks about, uh, you know, the city will be made up of plural folk. There will be rulers and there will be the ruled, and they're not the same. In the class of rulers, you have you have the guardians and the philosopher rulers, and by the way, it's always plural, rulers. You don't have a philosopher ruler. Otherwise, you just have a tyranny. And he talks about the tyranny in all of Book 9 of the Republic. And what's very interesting about the philosopher, his remarks about the philosopher rulers also is that, that not only are they plural, but they work in a plural number of teams. Now, why should they be working with a team? Well, it's because they are rulers who take charge of everything. And everything means when you're running a city, when you're running a school, you have to worry about uh, finance, you have to worry about foreign affairs, you have to worry about uh, building bridges and public transportation systems, etc., that, that, the infrastructure, you have to worry about many things at the same time. Now, no one single person can do that. You need a team for that. So the philosopher rulers will be plural and they will have assistants, the guardians. So you have to understand that what this is all building up to really is uh, rulership is a question of uh, service rendered to a very complex city. What Plato uh, called earlier the fevered city, not the not a small village where everybody knows what to do. <coughs> where everybody loves one another. That's no place to do philosophy in. You know, you can only do philosophy, you can only engage in critical thinking and critical action when the city has many broken bridges that need to be repaired. It's a fevered city. But to be able to do that, you need a plurality of people who will be attending to different things at the same time. And the philosopher rulers are precisely those kinds of people that would be able, together with assist, receiving assistance from the guardians, to attend to different things at the same time. So they have to be quite well coordinated and working in teams, and in various teams because it's very tiring work. This is all at the very end, towards the very end of book seven. You'll find it there. So that. At any given time, one team will be ruling, and they'll rule for a while. There are also limits, term limits. And when the, their time of rulership is over, they go down into renewal while another team takes over. That's how Plato saw it. And mind you, he's talking about a relatively small city. He's not talking about a country like ours of 105 million people. 
It's talking about a relatively small city of 50,000, including the, children, the women and the children and the slaves. So maybe there are only 2,000 male adults and another 2,000 female adults. And that's another point that I'd like to make uh, against uh, the, the disciplinary civilization, which tends to be huge. You can only practice a democracy when the context is small and participation is possible. When, in fact, you can wrap your mind around who it is that's in the city with you. That's the only material condition in which it is possible to practice true democracy. In our city, in the Republic of the Philippines, we go by the name democracy. We are the Republic of the Philippines, therefore we're, we say we're a democracy. What do you mean to tell me in this democracy? Casting your ballot once every four years or once every two years for 20 minutes, a 20 minute exercise for most people, that is already democracy? No, democracy is 724, face to face, participatory. So, what we have is only a parody of democracy, not democracy. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. So, anyway, uh, all right, so you have to keep in mind that uh, the philosopher rulers are uh, plural and they rule in and through coordination, proper coordination. Because after all, it is a city that they have, it's an entire city which they have to run. So the philosopher rulers can be compared to good urban planners. So in other words, what that's really what philosophy is, urban planning. The idea of philosophy as metaphysics, I mean to say that is a later idea, which in my opinion is an aberration. I mean, philosophy is not really specifying the territories and subterritories of being. No, of course not. Philosophy is good urban planning. That's how it started. That's, you know, the philosophy that Plato and Aristotle began was a philosophy was really all about urban planning, good urban planning, good living within the context of good urban planning. So anyway, uh, so let's go back to what Plato says. First of all, you have to take them away from parental influence. So begin with them very young. After all, you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. So I'll start with them very young. But it's, so Aristotle says something similar. It's like you start with them when they're still a black slave. It is possible for you to write on it. Not when it's already been completely overwritten. <clears throat> and the first thing you have to teach them, Plato says, is teach them not to be afraid of death. That's the first thing he says in book three. But what does it mean not to be afraid of death? We don't know what, any, what happens after death. We know we say in faith that Jesus Christ you know, died. He went to hell, the realm of the dead, and then rose again. And then eventually ascended to heaven. And as far as I know, he hasn't yet come back to tell us about heaven. So therefore, nobody knows exactly what heaven is like. So let's not preoccupy ourselves with it. So in other words, when he says, teach your philosophers not to be afraid of death, what he really means is, teach your philosophers to seize life, to develop commitments to life. To see that life is a whole collection of all kinds of different concerns, but then to eventually slowly put them into a hierarchy of concerns until you finally will have a set of ultimate concerns. Now, to be able to do that, again, uh, this is a common theme for Plato. You need passion. You need passionate dedication. To be able to seize upon life as a whole collection of very important concerns 
Well, as Friedrich Nietzsche put it when he talked about the passion for knowledge, he said, do you long for knowledge in the same way that a lion longs for its food? But how does a lion long for its food? It doesn't run after its food. It, might, it has to struggle with its food in a death struggle. It might even get killed while going after its food. But you must be able to risk that if you really have a passion for knowledge. That's what, Nietzsche, that's what Plato also meant by passion. So in other words, when he says, teacher, guardians not to be afraid of death, he's not basically saying just teach them to simply become passive in relation to death. No, he's not saying that at all. In other words, the image that you associate with Plato, and therefore, and, and, and by rep, uh, the law of transitivity, or, uh, the image you attach to Jesus Christ, for example, it's never of a Buddha sitting on a lotus flower or maybe sitting under the Bodhi tree with his eyes closed and then sleeping. That's not the Christian image of philosophy. The Christian image of philosophy is one of doing. One of, it's like a whirlwind. The philosopher is like a whirlwind. The philosopher is not about contemplation. Plato, therefore, is not about contemplation. That's very important. Plato is not about contemplation. It's not about metaphysics. It's not about living in a world beyond this world. It's not about seeking after perfection, paying no attention to this world, which is the world of imperfection. No, it's precisely about taking and making your target this world which is imperfect precisely. And because it is an imperfect world, then you have a job to do. Because if it is already perfect, then therefore you have no job at all to do except to maybe go to sleep. It's like the... Well, I think I, I gave this example in class before, you know, the, the Japanese green tea ceremony. The tea ceremony. You know, in the ceremony, if you attend the ceremony, it's like it takes hours for them to prepare the tea. But what's interesting about the ceremony is it, it's very orna ornamented, very heavily ornamented. Like, only the Japanese can ornament things. But what's interesting about the ceremony is that one or another item which is used in the ceremony has to have an imperfection. Maybe the cup with a little chink. Or maybe the teapot is a little broken. Because in other words, the Japanese uh, accept the fact that nothing in life is perfect. Or maybe it's like the Buddhist monks of Tibet, who spend all their time working on these marvelous, wonderful mandalas, you know, maybe three days. These beautiful designs which they make, in circular designs they make on the ground with bits of colored sand. And then when they complete the mandala, they, they get up and they sweep everything away and they start again. In other words, nothing in this life is perfect. That's why we have a job to do. It's like saying, uh, all men and women are born unequal. Because that's the truth. All men and women are born unequal. So therefore we have a job to do to try to make, to level the playing field for all men. That's still a job. It's still something to do. Leveling the playing field for all men and women so that there will be greater equality and greater fairness. Because right now, there is no equality. And so forth and so on. But let me just say, say a couple more things, you know. Like Plato also says, teach your guardians not to laugh too hard. Because when you laugh too hard, you begin to think that the best solution is the magical solution, the breathing the words hocus pocus abracadabra, waving your magic wand and everything will be alright. The deus ex machina. There's no such thing as a deus ex machina in life. 
the only thing that will enable you to set things right in life will be to roll up your sleeves and engage in hard work, in serious work. Maybe that's the, our problem as Filipinos too. Maybe that's the reason why we have a, such a terribly run country. We don't realize that there is work to be done. You know, we just say, oh, I'd like to work, but then I, there, there seems to be no work for me. Of course there's work to be done. Should we be proud of the OFW phenomenon? <laughs> 10% of our population, they, they say, of our adult population is with the OFWs. These are cop-outs. Instead of staying right here and facing the problem, agitating for reform, they just go abroad. They just turn their back on the problem. So maybe it's not something to crow about. And maybe that's one thing wrong also with many of our education institutions. We prepare people to become all of W's, even at USD. Many of our uh, courses are marketed precisely to students, you know, on the prospect, uh, with the prospect that they might be able to find work abroad, like HRM. Why well, are there enough hotels in the Philippines to uh, accommodate all the HRM uh, graduates at all our schools churn out. No, it's an invitation. For, or even medicine, PTs, and so forth and so on. You know, it's really, uh, we, don't make, we may not explicitly say, but what we really mean is, if you uh, um, come to us and receive this training, etc., you might get stand a chance of going abroad. So instead of getting people, inspiring people to stay and meet the problem head on, we just uh, show them to the door which leads to an easy way out. So he says, teach your guardians not to laugh too hard. And teach your guardians not to imitate fictions. But to model their lives after flesh and blood exemplars who have fought and not <clears throat> heeded the wounds, who have toiled and not sought for rest who have labored and not asked for reward. They live the down the street from you. You know who they are. So instead of attending to Alden Richards and Kim Chu or whatever, and all kinds of the X-Men and so forth and so on, you know, instead of attending to those uh, characters, those fictional characters, attend to flesh and blood exemplars. I mean, you know, we are a terrible nation when it comes to that. So, for example, at the end of the Second World, who did we, who did we reward? We forget all about, what was the name of the uh, Abad Santos? Was he Vicente Abad Santos? Jose, Jose. Jose Abad Santos, who was uh, executed by the Japanese for refusing to collaborate with them. And he said we rewarded all the collaborators. They're the wealthy people now, the collaborators. What, 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 what values we have? People who, uh, you know, gave their lives because they refused to collaborate with the enemy. And we, we have completely forgotten. Instead, we reward people who slept with the enemy. And, and of course, there's something similar, it's parallel now. We have an administration that's playing footsie footsie with China. And, say another, and we reward this administration by electing in the most recent election, you know, all of its candidates. <laughs> but we, uh, we heap scorn when people who mention, point out the opposite. We should be doing the opposite. We should be confronting the enemy instead of sleeping with the enemy. Something similar. So teach your guardians not to imitate fictions. But you know, to be able to be a guardian not imitating fictions, you need to have passion. So you know, that's what I'm trying to say, is that Ed Plato's educational program, all of it is about the cultivation of 
spiritedness. Well, that's how he defines his guardians in the first place. His uh, candidate rulers. They're, they stand for spirit. Enough of it so that they become solicitous and loving towards their masters, but terrible and a plague upon their enemies. The enemies of their masters. But you, to be able to be that, you need to fill out. You need to have passion. You need, you need to be like a cobra willing to spread your hood. Or you have to be a peacock willing to spread your tail to confuse the enemy. Well, that's why in, in the peacock's uh, feathers are many round things that look like eyes. Well, that's what the way the peacock defends itself. To confuse the enemy, to make it think like... Uh, it's fighting a creature with many eyes. That many creatures, therefore. But to be able to do that, you, instead of to turn tail and run away, you have to have passion. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the pedagogy that Plato uh, espouses in the Republic and in the Laws. Now the Laws is a book in which it talks about the third class of people, the ordinary people in general, the citizens of the city. In the Republic, he talks about the rulers. He does say there are three kinds of people. You have the guardians, the false rulers, and then the people in general. But it's not yet time to talk about the people because the emergency of the moment when he wrote the Republic was the lack of good leadership in Athens. So he talks about the rulers, and he talks about the fact that the rulers have to be cultivated, the rulers have to be formed. Rulership is not a matter of uh, genes. It's a matter. It's not a matter of uh, which family you belong to. No, rulership is a matter of investing someone with the skills required for good rulership. So that's so. That's what the republic is all about. It's a pedagogy for the training and education, and formation, etc., of people who will be your as city's rulers. It's a school of, it's about establishing a school of government. The Athenium was a school of government. Now what about the people in general? Well he attends to that question much later in life, about 35 years later. And in fact he dies before he is able to absolutely complete the work. Maybe 90% of the work gets written, then he dies. But enough of it gets written so we know what it is that he wanted, what he believed in. And he passionately believed in the fact that the people in general also have to understand that they need to participate in supporting the city with their own contributions. And, you know, Plato had uh, suggests several... Uh, devices by which uh, people will be made interested in their own city to work for it. So the first thing he talks about is, uh, first of all, in the city there will only be four property classes. Yeah, he, he uh, makes allowance for diversity. But not for extreme diversity. In the Philippines we don't have four property classes, we have four million property classes. <coughs> So that the extremes cannot talk to each other anymore. But in the Cretan city, which is his daughter city to the city of justice. Now why, is, why, why was there a need to have a daughter city? Well, you know, like I said, Plato always believed in the practice of democracy being face-to-face -face and participatory. And so therefore when the city became too large and unwieldy, over 50,000 more or less, Maybe the size of USD on any single day is only about 50,000. So maybe USD is a perfect example of what would be Sana, a good platonic city, in terms of size. If it got more than that, then encourage the members of the city to branch out in colonies. So that's why he writes the laws, which is about the Cretan colony and the daughter city to the city of justice. And he, he 
want to make sure that everybody in that Cretan colony, the Cretan city, feels that they are truly a part of the city and a part of running the city. And uh, one of the ways in which it can be done is get them to be always talking to one another. Get them to be able to always be relating to one another. And you can do that by taking allowance, making allowance for diversity, but at the same time for integrity, for unity. So there are going to be four property classes. Four property classes subjected to all kinds of electoral procedures. Now the most uh, major electoral procedure that it proposes is for is the election of the members of a 360 strong council made up of 90, 90, 90, and 90, each 90 representing a property class. Truly representing a property class is not like our party list system, where the party list congressmen, uh, you know, are really just the brothers and sisters and cousins of the regular congressmen. So we, get, we, we, we have somebody representing, for example, the party list for security guards, who is anything but a security guard. You know, we're so corrupt that way. We, 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 uh, we, we parody. First of all, if we don't run a democracy. But even the fact that this very thing that we have, which is really not a democracy, we parody. But anyway, so the... the Elections and the members of the council, which is just uh, symbolic. I mean, 360 in a city which is relatively small was pretty uh, significant. And the thing is, what, what is very interesting about the Platonic election was that it would take place over five days. Can you imagine that? We already complain if we have to stand in line for two hours once every four years uh, to participate in an election. But in the case of the relatively small Cretan city, there could not have been more than 4,000 votantes. Because the, the rest were made up of the children and the slaves. Of course, in the Cretan colony, uh, just as in the city of justice, uh, women and men were had equal standing. So let's say both, or, both adult men and adult women participated in the election. So that's maybe 4,000 tops. And why five days? Because four out of the five days were getting to know one another days. You got to know you who the candidates were. You, uh, well, for the Cretan colony was, this, was divided up into 12 tribes. Why 12? Well, to correspond to the months of the year. Because in Plato's system, one tribe for one month of a given year would take charge of all the administrative work, and then after their month was over, another tribe would take over, and so it does equal sharing of administrative responsibility. But in an election time, People were to go across tribal barriers to get to know one another, to get to know who the candidates were. Because every tribe had four property classes. So they had to get to know who the candidates were of a particular property class, you know, from the other tribes. You know. So there would be great, there would be vast circulation. Okay, so that was, was one way in which people, Plato already got to, got the people to get to know one another well, well enough to want to be able to participate in the public life of the city. And then furthermore, to get them to participate in the public life of the city in and through the so-called magistracies, the different jobs available. So in a lifetime, it was possible for a citizen to take on one job after another, after another, after another for the sake of the city for most of that citizen's mature life. Especially because most of the jobs, except a very few number of jobs, had term limits of only one year. So at the end of that year, 
the citizen would have to take on another job, and at the end of the next year, another job. And in that way, circulate around. Now, through such divide, and then of course there were many other public events like uh, athletic contests. And the, the, the Plato was very fond of uh, uh, mounting contests. Athletic contests, choral contests, drama contests. Activities which got the people to participate in the public life. So in any given year, for at least half the calendar year, citizens would be involved in activities which would require them to mix with one another. But you know, to be able to uh, be that kind of a people, you have you had to be a people of passion, a people that was willing to make so long. People that was willing to just jump in, not wallflower people, not lame duck people. But you know what a lame duck is, right? A lame duck politician is one who in a sense knows that uh, because other people have already been elected, he's just biding his time until he, it's, it's time to go out. He cannot do anything anymore. He no longer will be the mayor next time. He just has a few more weeks in the position. He's a lame duck. But in Plato's Cretan colony, or in the Republic of Plato, the city of justice, there's no such thing as a lame duck citizen. To be a citizen means you have to be willing to make, and eager to make so long, to jump right in. Okay, so in other words, uh, we can come back to this in the course of our presentation of Foucault, but uh, in, in general, uh, the citizens of the Republic, the citizens of the Cretan colony, the citizens of the city of justice had to be men and women able to rise to any occasion requiring the services of citizenship. They had to be men and women filled with passion. They had to be men and women who were not merely flat, but men and women who were three-dimensional, who were solid, who, were, who had volume, who, had, who were animated, who, who were animated by a sense of mission, a sense of service that they would render to the common good, and not merely to personal or private good. So the pedagogy of Plato is all about the cultivation of spirit. quite different from the pedagogy which is operational in our own time, in our own society, which is about the annihilation of spirit. So you have to maybe reflect on the extent, you know, to which you yourselves as products of this pedagogy are really examples, when you come to think of it, of much spirit that has been taken out of you. And as a result of that, you are not doers, but only zombie followers, for the most part, even as philosophy teachers, even as students of philosophy. Our favorite phrase is yes, boss. That's the legacy of the educational system we went through. It's the education of the fact that we belong, we are citizens of the disciplinary civilization. Okay, so uh, are, are there any questions about Plato and his approaches to education? My main point about Plato was that uh, you know Platonic education uh, really uh, involved the cultivation, the education, the formation, the uh, insertion into people of spirit, spiritedness, of passion. Yes. Um, it seems that Plato already have figured out everything, but. Uh, what 
what what would Plato say about I don't know in the Republic? Um, does he say something about uh, about the penal system? What if some citizens would not follow certain rules, certain laws? What would be the consequence? How would they be getting on the track again? I don't know. Well, you know, there are two books like I told you that he wrote: that the Republic and the Laws. Now, you have to read those two books first. And then maybe read the other dialogues later on. Because uh, you're having the, the two major books as constant companions will enable you to interpret Plato more correctly. Because if you read the dialogues, you know, the dialogues can be made, can be made to say almost anything. That's why people generally who have this wrongful two-world interpretation of Plato's objective, for the most part, they have done them. The laws. And they never mention the Republic. Because when you do, I mean to say, this is to put the lie to your interpretation. It seems to me. Now, I'll answer your question in a while. Uh, before I forget, uh, let me mention that, well, of course, the Republic is the Republic, and you should read the Republic, and the laws are very difficult to read. Now, a good way to get into the spirit of the laws of Plato is a book by Glenn Morrow. It came out in maybe the 60s, 1960s. It's, it's not a recent book, but it's a very fine book. Its scholarship is perennial. And it's a book called The Cretan City by Glenn Morrow. So if you have taken a course with me in this school uh, on, uh, uh, on ancient, in ancient philosophy, you would, you, you would have been told about it. Now, it's, I, I think it's, uh, you were in that class by uh, uh, ancient philosophy. Uh, no, who, who, who are in the class ancient philosophy? Is there anyone here? Yeah, do you have your copy of, did you have the Cretan City, don't you? Did you get downloaded from the internet? Uh, so it is on the internet. So you can, maybe you can get from uh, uh, her, your, her address, her internet address. Because you can download the book from the internet and then hard copy it. And it will be worth it. You know, I tell, I tell people, you know, if you've stopped reading the Gospels, you're tired of it, that's okay. You just bring Plato with you because it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, like I said, that, that is the meaning of the Incarnation. If you truly believe that Christ was incarnated into a specific time and culture which is Greek, Greek and uh, uh, Roman and uh, Jewish, then it's correct to say that if you stop reading uh, the Gospels, then read some of the other sources. Okay, so anyway, uh, just some information concerning a good book to read uh, alongside of your uh, examination of the loss of Plato, which is notoriously difficult to read in a sense. Now, uh, okay, now to go to your, to, to, to go back, does he mention any, what, what about penalties? Now, in the, he talks a lot about penalties in a way, he talks about it in the laws. So, for, so for example, when he, he says, for example, you know, in relation to the different magistracies, of course you, in relation to any magistracy, you would propose uh, candidates. So there would be a number of people in charge precisely of the work of vetting candidates, examining credentials. Now, that's for candidates, and that, that way you, only, you make sure that only those with the right credentials, you know, will serve, can serve in a particular magistrate. Now, given the fact that uh, a person already has served in a magistrate at the end of his term, which is for the most part only one year, there will be another group of people, what were they called? The Euthinoi? Yeah, I think the Euthinoi whose job was simply to evaluate the performance of a person in public office. And if that person 
was discovered to have been wanting on the job, either corrupt or maybe lazy or whatever, whatever, he would be penalized by the youth in oil. They were like the ombudsman. But you know, the difference being, like for our own ombudsman, okay, you have an ombudsman, and then one for Visayas, one for Luzon, one for Mindanao, but that's only four people for 105 million people. Whereas in the case of the Cretan city and the, the city of justice, you had, you had many youth in oil for a city of only 50,000. So there was immediate accountability. So yeah, it's true, there were penalties. <coughs> and uh, usually the penalties is, would be set by another group of people who knew the law concerning a job, the interpreters of the law, the exegetes of the law, the nomophila case. And Plato specifies there would be 37 altogether in the Cretan colony, but 37 monophilic in a city in which you only had 4,000 adults is pretty high. Right? It's a lot of people. So they would know all the job descriptions, job specifications, and they would be able to say whether or not a person was able to fulfill all of the details of the job while in office, and if not, penalize that person. So there were penalties. And in particular, of, of, of particular interest to us would be the penalties he attaches to people who deny the role of religion in urban planning. Now you have to remember always that Plato was not a theologian. The best word that I have for to describe him, therefore, since he was not a theologian, that he could only have been, at best, an urban planner. And a, and a good urban planner knows that if, for as long as the society remains uh, deeply religious, it's a good gathering uh, point, principle. Use re the, the very word religion, religare, ligare, ligation, tying together. I mean, the procedure called ligation in family planning, for example, means tying up a woman's fallopian tube so that she cannot have a baby anymore. The idea is of tying, tying, relig religion. In other words, people tied together by their f common faith in God or the gods. <laughs> An urban planner takes that into account. It's one way. I mean, we need an urban planner realizes that to get, to get a city to uh, come together, you need to get you need all the help you can get. And if there is help, uh, uh, you know that coming from coming from religion, then use it. Now Plato operated in a deeply religious society still, and so there's one section of the laws in which he talks about. <laughs> the laws against impiety. In other words, if someone in this deeply religious culture were to say that, no, there's no God, there's no gods, then that person is like a cancer in the community. You have to stop it. Now Plato is rather generous. He says, give that person, first throw him into jail, into prison, and give him a chance to recant his, to consider, reconsider his ways, his belief, give him a chance lasting five years. So, generous Pasha. After all, five years is a long time to get a person to change his mind. Aristotle later on was much less generous when he talks about the vicious people, you know, Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics talks only about two vices. He talks about the vice of incontinence and he talks about the vice of intemperance. And here's, well, you, you know the difference, I'm sure, but in, 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 case, in the case of intemperate people, Aristotle talks about, well, you know, in the case of an intemperate person, someone who obviously clearly is marching to the beat of a different drum than the drum uh, role of the community itself, you have to either exile that person, banish him, uh, put him on a remote island where he cannot possibly be uh, 
uh, a factor of influence uh, as far as uh, the people in the city are concerned. But if you cannot do that, kill him. So Aristotle is more, more impatient. So in other words, uh, right away you have to, because Aristotle's idea is if you allow a person like that to uh, survive in, in your community, it's like a cancer, it will spread. You want to stop it. But Plato is more generous, he says five years. So if someone stands up on a soapbox and says there is no God or there are no gods, then it's a, he's being impious. He's being irreligious. So punish him, throw him into prison, and give him a chance over five years to change his mind. Or if a person says, yeah, there are gods, but they don't care. That's another form of impiety. To uh, preach the word that the gods don't really care about human beings, well, what you do is you get, uh, again, give them a chance, throw them into prison, first of all, separate them from the community, and in prison, give them a chance to reconsider their beliefs. And if after five years, they still don't reconsider the belief, then that's when you can execute him. And uh, finally, he says, uh, if a person says there are gods and they can be bribed, well, that's another way of saying that the gods are no better than human beings, they're just uh, human creations, you can, which you can bribe. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you bribe the gods, in a sense, you're just bribing yourself, etc., etc. Now, if a person believes that, then again, it's uh, a way of denigrating a religion, so uh, uh, what you must do is separate that person immediately from the community and uh, give that person a chance over five years to change his mind if he does that. So in others, yes, uh, he does uh, mention, uh, he does talk about, because it's important when you're building, a, when you're uh, stringing together the ties that bind in a, in a complex city, you, you inevitably will have to talk about uh, uh, what will you do about people who are not very cooperative. You, you have to, and, and uh, what example will you give to people uh, in case they do not exactly cooperate? You have to, give a, you have to have provide a few examples of, people, of what you do to people who don't exactly cooperate, etc., etc. So, th therefore, there is uh, uh, talk about penalty also. When, so, that, that, that's, one, that's another reason why, I mean, he, he definitely could not have been interested only in a world beyond this world because he talks about penalties. He talks about very uh, minute seeing. And you know, when you read the laws, I mean, it's very minute. He talks about how to educate babies even in the womb. How mothers carrying babies in the womb have to be in constant motion because in life, life is constant motion. Now, a, a, a person who is merely metaphysical would not even consider a thing like that. No, but Plato was not metaphysical. He was very physical. He was very uh, finding uh, citizenship in everything. <coughs> not citizenship only in the heavens, but in everything, on earth. Is there any other questions? What time is it now? <coughs> is it nine already? Yeah, well, why don't we, uh, I'll give you a chance for a little uh, pit stop. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe for 10 minutes and then you can go relieve yourselves or whatever, just relax, uh, clear the mind and then we can go on. We can go ahead with our You know, when he founded this school, he obviously had to have colleagues. You cannot run the school just by yourself. And it was a, a very famous school. It's a renowned school. School uh, students came from all over the Greek world. You know, there were over 1,000 Greek city states. Now, the Greek city states never amalgamated into an empire the way the Roman Empire did. They remained mutually autonomous city states, and there were over a thousand of them. And the sons of the first and most important families from all the Greeks in the States went to Athens to study in Plato's school. It became very well known. Now obviously a school like that could only have become well known if it had good teaching, good accommodations, good, 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 good. In other words, Plato had to worry about a host of many things. 
That's why he talks about the philosopher rulers precisely as having to pay attention to many things at the same time. And therefore, they, could, they had to delegate to teams, to members of the team. So, so think of Plato in that way. Think of him as the founder of a school. And the successful, a very successful, you know, the, the academy in Athens lasted for until about the fall of Constantinople. So it lasted maybe 300 more years after the birth of Christ. And it, it began in Plato's lifetime 300 years more or less before the birth of Christ. So we're talking about a 600 year span. Now how old is Santo Tomas, USD? It talks it's often, it, it, it presents itself as the oldest university in Southeast Asia, but that is no more than 500 years old. Plato's academy lasted for 600 years. So in other words, you know, it could only have lasted, and the only reason it closed is because the emperor of, for Rome at the time decreed it to be closed. Not because it was, had run out of steam, but simply because of an imperial decree. I suppose the emperor was angry at it for some one reason or another. Well, that's a school which lasted several years, but the school which lasted certainly lasted, you know, at least uh, over Plato's lifetime. While it lasted and flourished during Plato's lifetime, it must have been because he was a very practical man. He did not even have his head in the clouds. And the cities and the problems of Plato's city are very much the same as our problems today of the country. writ large. So in other words, I'm trying to say is that <clears throat> in your philosophical presentations, rather than talk about Descartes, rather than talk about John Jacques Rousseau, rather than talk about all these philosophers that you talk about later on, why don't you start with Plato? It's more cogent, more interesting. And the source of philosophy. As somebody once wrote, everything after Plato is only a footnote to Plato. And it's true. I mean, he was, you know, just imagine the great mind that he possessed. Not only for dialectic, not only for philosophical dialectic, the dialogue form of philosophical presentation, the philosophical presentation of ideas, but also for keeping a city flourishing and together. Imagine his importance, how interesting it would be for for your, the minds of your students to be introduced to such a mind. Okay, so um, that, that's really a plug for yeah, go on with, uh, doing your work with Aristotle, I and mean, that's also important, but even more important than Aristotle is Plato. I suppose in a school like USC, it's mostly Aristotle because of Thomas Aquinas, but you know, don't forget that. Aristotle was only the pupil of Plato. And as many great men have said, including Jesus Christ, no pupil is greater than his master. And he's correct. Okay, so uh, let's move. Uh, well, the other thing is uh, uh, that I, I'd like to emphasize is uh, for Plato, the practice of democracy is possible to carry out only in a small scale context in which it is possible to engage in face-to-face -face activity which is participatory. Now we have the Republic of the Philippines which is very large. Even Singapore would be very large with its four or five million people. Even Brunei, how many millions of people live in Brunei? Does anybody know? Are there one million people? But even that would be too large. So, so how do we? Uh, so what? How? What, how do we make Plato relevant to our present large-scale setting? <coughs> well, you know, the Republic of the Philippines. We cannot push the hands of the clock. But 
we're already a republic of 105 million people. So there's a certain extent to which uh, certain things have to be, uh, certain works have to be continued. We need inter-island shipping, we need uh, roads, we need highways, we need public transportation, we need power sources. Somebody has to think about the fact that, uh, you know, power sourcing requires more than simply building more dams. You know, this old technology. When we uh, sort of like accept the fact that the, the weather patterns in the world are changing and rain will end up falling in all the wrong places except our dams. Right now we only have one or two major dams. Right now we, it's already the start of the rainy season and we, see we, we have a worsening water problem. That's because rain is falling in all the wrong places. It's falling in the middle of the ocean and it's not falling in Angkata. But that's the way it's going to be. You know, the, the, future, the future of the world will be a politics concerning at least water. Nations will go to war over water. Even now there's a kind of a tension between Singapore and Malaysia over water. You say Singapore doesn't have enough. It has to import from Malaysia. The Malaysians are becoming more stingy with their water because it knows that they also have to satisfy the needs of their own population, etc., etc. So why do we resort to uh, a solution which represents the operation of an old technology, dams? Why don't we do solar panels? Why don't we do wind energy? We'll always have winds, we'll always have the sun. Too much of it even in the Philippines. Well, why don't you make it a source of power? You know, somebody has to think about that. So yes, we do need national housekeeping. But at the same time, we also need the wisdom that can emanate from the grassroots. Now, why is it not being encouraged? Somebody talked about the LGUs, empower the LGUs. But no, that's not the solution because the LGUs are big. Even a barangay is too big. Which barangay do you live? How many people are there in your barangay? Like 100 million, 100,000? <laughs> You, you are in barangay. Uh, who knows? Uh, who, has a, who belongs in barangay uh, that you know the population of? Uh, uh, 2,500. Only 2,500 people in your barangay? Well, that's very tiny. Well, anyway, it's okay. It's so, that, uh, yeah, maybe. But I, I, thought, I had thought barangays were like over 100,000. Because parishes, Catholic parishes usually have over 50,000, 80,000, 100,000, and only one parish. The, the average uh, for uh, uh, number of inhabitants per barangay nationally is 200,000. So there you go. Now that, how can you have a democracy among 200,000 people? Uh, counting, let's say, uh, in a field of 200,000, you might have uh, uh, 5,000 adults. But how can you have a democracy with 5,000 adults? Well, USD has maybe, what, 30,000 people, but it's divided into many colleges. Because 30,000 as 30,000, just like that, is simply too big to manage. So, in other words, we need national housekeeping, but we also need the politics of the small. And Plato talks about instituting a politics of the small. That's, that's, that's another reason why it is good to teach him. So that people appreciate the fact that small is also beautiful. So while like not neglecting the requirements of the large, let's also pay attention to the small for the benefits that could accrue to us from paying attention to it. But our national institutions are just focused on the large because uh, when you're focused on the large, that's, it's, it's easier to become despotic when all that people see is 
when, when in a sense, uh, people are sort of like just simply surrounded by the darkness of the large. As happens in every Philippine election. The issues of the small are never addressed. <clears throat> well, how could they be addressed when all they do is sing and dance on the stage? All the politicians <coughs> sing and dance on the stage to distract us from paying attention to the small. Now, in a, in a way, Michel Foucault, when he uh, makes his critical points about disciplinarity, it's because disciplinarity is too large. Now, uh, you've heard, many of you have heard the name Michel Foucault forever and ever. Obviously, a lot of work has been done on Michel Foucault's, uh, on disciplinarity, and, and so forth and so on. Now, that is Michel Foucault 101. But you have to, you have to uh, go beyond the Foucault 101 to what it is that, therefore, so Foucault 101 ends with the observation that the disciplinary civilization is really just, it, it just ends in bankruptcy, it ends in darkness. No way forward, no exit. It's exactly what Jean-Paul Sartre said, no exit. Or Max, what, what Max Weber, the sociologist, said, you know, this is an iron cage, and there is no exit from this iron cage. No, but what Michel Foucault says is, you, you, you may not see it right now, but there is an exit. And he learned to say that from his uh, a, a philosopher, another philosopher whom he admired very much, Friedrich Nietzsche, who was not a nihilist, who did not, who, who was not a worshiper of only nothingness. He was not a necromancer, a worshiper of only deadness. No, he was not, but rather a great affirmer. In Nietzsche's case, affirmer of life. <coughs> and so taking his cue from Nietzsche, Michel Foucault, after he did his seminal work, which we call Foucault 101, uh, as uh, found, for example, in his books, This is a Punition, The History of, Philosophy of Sexuality, Volume 1. He says, you know, we get the impression from these two works that everything ends in bankruptcy. But really, there is a way out, but the way out is, first of all, the way in. Nietzsche had said earlier, the way forward is the way downward. You cannot go down, you cannot go across unless you first go down. Now, Michel Foucault's version of that is, you cannot see the pathway into the future without first entering and caring for yourself. It's the same thing as what Nietzsche had said beforehand. You can go across unless you go down. Okay, so let's take into consideration for a moment Foucault 101. Now, the, uh, the, uh, the main argument of Foucault that I'm focusing on in this class will be the, what I call the final Foucault. So that's Discipline and Punish, the first volume of the History of Sexuality, which he wrote maybe uh, within uh, 10 years of his death in 1984. And he died relatively young. Well, you know, well, well, let's see it now. You know, he died of AIDS because in 1984 nobody knew what AIDS was. They just thought it was something that mysteriously happened to gay men. Well, Foucault refused the term gay, but he was a same sex lover. You, in a sense, you have to be a member of a minority to be the voice for that minority. And that was, it was characteristic of Michel Foucault that all his life, he was the voice for the marginalized, for prisoners, he said, punish. For schoolboys, 
constrain the force to uh, receive, the, accept the discipline of schools. They, were, they also are a minority. The equivalent of the, of the children in the Gospels. You know, children in the Gospels are not cute and cuddly things. No, they were a metaphor of the oppressed. Because in the society that Jesus grew up in, children were not of value. In the case of a famine, you fed the older ones first. Only last would you feed the child. Because the child was not yet of value. And it is the Lord who says, you know, these marginalized people, these people who you say are of no value yet, let them come unto me. And unless you become like them, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So that's why in the Gospels you have him uh, sort of like take the side of all the marginalized women, especially prostitutes, the tax collectors, the, the drunken, the gluttons, the lepers, children. You know, Michel Foucault similarly was an advocate of school children. An advocate of prisoners. An advocate of victims of the law, the jurisprudence. After all, he talks a lot about prisons, but prisons are established by the law. So in other words, if prisons are giba, it's probably because the law itself is giba. The law itself, the jurisprudence itself of a nation, supports a very unjust and unequal social grid of the nation. When you come to think of it, one of the most unjust laws in our land are the back secrecy laws, produced by legislators who produce those laws to protect themselves so that all their blood money can be hidden away from the public. being recorded, I might get salvaged by myself. <laughs> <laughs> so don't show it to certain people, okay? <laughs> no, but that's true. I mean, why do you suppose uh, Ben Biokno was selected to become central bank governor and he was not even a bank man? He was, he's a finance man, not a bank man. Well, obviously, certain powers that we need their secret deposits in bank accounts to be protected by the so-called AMLA laws, the bank secrecy laws. So, you, so President Duterte maybe put Ben Diokno there to sort of like serve as a rear guard. You know, and yet it's a, a le legislation like that serves to protect only the most corrupt and unjust members of our society. Just the other two nights ago, I attended the wake of a relative who had served as both Estrada, but before that had served the Marcus and was still in the service of Bong Bong when he died. And so, of course, both the Mar Marcus and Imelda was there in the wake, and then uh, Bong Bong and his wife, and then Joe Estrada also, etc., etc. Why is Imelda at the age of 90? Why is she still running around free? She should be jailed at the key lost. <laughs> I don't care if she's already 90. She committed her crimes when she was 35. She has to pay for it. And why are the Marcus is back in power? You know, it's really strange. We are a strange people. <laughs> so, uh, when I got a little sidetracked. What was it I was talking about? Yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> so in other words, the, the unjust, the corrupt, are protected by the very jurisprudence of the nation, of the land. And jurisprudence, which of course is a product of members of their class. Which is why in the Philippines, because of these laws which protect the uh, advantages of members of a specific class only, Why the legislators in the Philippines, for the most part, belong also to that class. So the laws they produce are 
laws only that enable them to promote themselves. <laughs> so Michel Foucault looks at the prisoner and says, you know, very clearly, there's a lot of injustice that, uh, uh, you know, definitely presents itself when you look at the prison, and therefore the laws which establish the prison have to be also unjust. <laughs> So the laws of the society do have a purpose to protect the unjust. So don't dwell on the fact that from the standpoint of uh, effecting conditions of justice, the laws are a failure. Don't dwell on the fact that they're a failure. No, dwell on the fact that they're a tremendous success. They protect the unjust. That's the success of it. So don't think only about the failure. Think of the success. Okay, so anyway, just to make things a little more systematic, you know, when we, in Discipline Punish, Michel Foucault makes, critically interrogates two <coughs> disciplinary institutions which are very pervasive, he believes. The school apparatus, the educational apparatus, and number two, the prisons and therefore the jurisprudence. Of a nation. Now, why is the school system for him a hotbed of injustice? It, you know, Michel, Michel Foucault, you could say, understands justice to mean exactly the same thing that Plato did in the Republic. Justice means well working, the wellness of the system. Injustice, therefore, connotes a system gone topsy turvy or awry. And school systems contribute to, to it. We have in the Philippines exactly the same situation that Plato complained about. As one of the reasons why his own city of Athens was already in a period of decline. <clears throat> Namely, any the school systems at work in the Philippines that are worth writing home about, for the most part, are like homeschooling institutions. When you think of the top Philippine schools, Ateneo, UST, La Salle, or even UP Dilemma, they're just a reflection, they're just a a first cousin of all these private schools, but it's really private education. Are you educating people for the good of the nation, for the common good, or are you educating people only for sectoral? <coughs> I mean, we have rhetorical statements. In Atari, we talk about the man and woman for others. What do you talk about in USD? What, what 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 is your product at USD uh, that's like the man and woman for others? But it's only rhetoric. You're instead educating people to defend the corrupt. Your lawyers defend only the corrupt. They are corrupt themselves. <laughs> <laughs> no, when you come to think of it, your your engineers. How do they become the wealthiest people in our community? Because they're engineers, right? There's a lot of skeletons in their closet. Your communications department. What, what's communications if not learn, teaching people how to professionally become liars? I mean, that, what do, what's, what's advertising if not about professional lying? Well, is Jollibee good for you? Of course, the Jollibee advertisement says, wow, become a Jollibee and fly or whatever. <laughs> But you know, if you take too much Jolly Bee, as so many people do, children nowadays will eat only Jolly Bee products, well, they will end up diabetic or hypertensive when they're only 40 years old. You know, and, and, and uh, what outfits, you know, uh, uh, paper the, you know, sort of like pad the cage, it's advertising outfits. And that's, 
That's what our schools do. There is no doubt about the fact. There is no doubt, I don't doubt that in our schools, people get invested with phenomenal skills and talents. And that is precise. And, and you know, I, I'm not, not, people with these skills and talents don't necessarily are not the ones that have to go to rectal to get a fake degree. No, there's people with actual, with real talent. But it's precisely these people who have talent that are part of the problem. They're not the solution. At every convention exercise, at every institution, you'll have both the valedictorian and the guest speaker talking about how the young are the future of our land. This is the solution. Education is the solution. But not our kind of education. Our education merely prepares people to become successful operatives standing alongside assembly lines of production. So there's great productivity that results from these assembly lines. How do we know that? How can we know that? Well, just go into any major supermarket. You'll see all the 100 brands of shampoo, the 200 brands of soap, which we don't need. But they're there anyway. The assembly lines of production produce them. What Nietzsche called the brightly colored seashells that children play with. But our schools do not, for the most part, instruct us on the difference between assembly lines that produce paper clips and chocolate candy. From the, the other work of that very same assembly line, which is the production of weapons of mass destruction. The products of our school systems are not motivated to ask the political question, should we go ahead and produce the atomic bomb, which our mathematics and our physics and our science allows us to. That is a political question. That is a question that should be debated by all sectors of a community. But precisely because we do not educate our students, for the most part, to be political. To understand that this planet is occupied, is inhabited by more than just one person. But by a plurality of persons. A plurality of its perspectives. That plurality is almost never engaged. So the problem that Michel Foucault has with our school system is, that it invests us with phenomenal skills, no doubt, enough to entitle us to stand beside assembly lines of production. But only as docile and obedient operatives standing along these assembly lines. Our school systems churn out a result which is highly skilled, but which is also docile and obedient, just like a zombie might be. <clears throat> they don't know. They have, they have no inner. They have no inner insight into anything. And depending on the philosophy you teach, maybe you also participate in precisely that uh, <clears throat> general effect of school system. The effect of distracting students away from real issues. So you'll get them to read beautiful things that maybe Descartes said or whatever, but that's beside the point. What about getting the inspiring them to ask real questions <coughs> even when they're embarrassing questions? Why uh, make the case that they should look up at the skies when in fact the work to be done, that should be done, is right here down on earth? You know, at the end of the Gospels, you know, the apostles 
were reduced to this man looking up at the sky where Jesus' feet disappeared into the clouds during the ascent, after the ascension. And angels had to come down to tell them, will you stop looking at the sky? Jesus is not there. What we want you to do, what Jesus wants you to do is for you to go back to Galilee. Your place of origin. Your place of ordinary life. Your place of everyday life. And there in Galilee, you will find him again. Now, do we ever do that in our classrooms? Do we <coughs> exhort them to go back to Galilee? Or instead, do we uh, encourage them rather to fantasize about going into the land of Oz? Or maybe to Filipinize, to make it more contemporary, the land of the X-Men. Everybody knows the X-Men. Everybody knows the Avengers. Everybody knows Star Trek and Star Wars. But do we know Galilee? Do we know the ordinary lives of people? That's one thing you can do in your classes. Get them to appreciate the details of their ordinary lives. The ordinary relationships. But instead, you know, we, uh, we have the kind of society where people feel they have no more energy after a long days of automatic work in the office and then long commutes home to work and then uh, home from work, etc., etc. For many people lasting four to five hours a day. I mean, just to get from Atene to USD takes about two hours when the traffic is bad. That's one way. So what I said about four hours a day, that's, that's true. Most people have to put up with a commute of four hours a day. So in others, when they go home, they have no more ex extra energy left over, except maybe to <coughs> eat potato chips and watch TV and uh, go to sleep. And so they don't have time anymore to think about more important, the really important questions. That's a form of distraction. Our way of life is a form of distraction. So why do we put up with it? Why don't we instead demand, you know, that uh, the administration, you know, pay attention to, uh, you know, the fact that our public transportation system keeps breaking down, etc., etc. We have too many gated communities, etc., etc., uh, worsening the traffic of the city. Why are there too many cars on the road? Why do we have to have grab taxis? That's only worse than the car, uh, the traffic situation, for the sake of one or two people that call them. You know, those are the really important questions, but you know, those questions are never raised. Almost never raised. <coughs> do, you, do you think the solution will be to build more elevated highways? Okay, they, they, when they finish that elevated highway, there will be more traffic, obviously. Because we think that by building an elevated highway will lessen the congestion. Of course not. It will increase the congestion. Because the thing has not been well enough thought out. So that's basically what our schools do. They're places in which we allow disciplinarity, in which we allow panopticism. We allow the forces of control that force us, that cause us to submit. We allow them to operate and to cover their tracks in our schools. We don't call attention to the fact that our school systems, for example, are Many splendid places for the invention of fictions. Many in the Philippines alone, many people who went for four year training programs and get diplomas in the end of them, a million of them each year go around and can never get a job. Meaning to say what they got to learn in school was really just fake. How many fly-by-night institutions exist? Fake. How many 
really, do we really need such majors? Yeah, because it's easy money for the owners of a school. But we don't really need those majors. Do we really need a new model car and the expert uh, technicians, you know, that make them? Do we need a new model car where, in fact, the only difference between the, the model this year and last year's model was they changed a uh, headline? No, really. I mean, that's the only difference. The same thing with phones. They just change the look of the phone. And they say it's already the newest model. <clears throat> so there's a lot of fakery that goes on at these institutions. Do we educate our people to be on the lookout for such and to call attention to such fakery? Or do we train them instead to always be looking downward at the assembly line, only to mind their own business on the assembly line, and not the common good. So in that sense, there are many critical points that we can make about our school systems. But you know, what it comes down to in Foucault is the school system, for the most part, could invest, probably invest, people with phenomenal skills, but at the same time, takes away the passions of people. So they become flat. They become hollow men and women. You know that poem by T.S. Eliot, The Hollow Men, had pieces filled with straw, running on broken glass in a rat cellar, running on broken feet in a rat cellar over broken glass. You know, that, that's basically what our schools uh, produce, just a lot of highly skilled but hollow men and women. Who precisely because they, not, they do not think deliver a world that now, right now, is for the most part uh, governed by atomic bomb diplomacy. When you consider, for example, that a man who obviously is in many ways psychologically deficient himself, Donald Trump, the so-called leader of the free world, travels all the way to Singapore to shake hands with President Kim of North Korea, a well-known murderer. Who the world has uh, definitely established murdered his own brother for having cooperated with the South Koreans. And whose people are so brainwashed. I was watching a BBC documentary some time ago about a group of doctors who, as a service to the North Korean people, went uh, to North Korea to operate on uh, North Korean eyes that were <coughs> blinded by cataracts. You know, cataracts are, you know, these hard. Uh, Deposits gather in the eye, you know, occluding uh, vision. But if the so the thing to do is to take away the uh, the occlusion of vision, and they can see again. So they performed the, these operations. So there were hundreds of people that were able to see again. You know, able to be rescued, so to speak, from the blind and sick. But as soon as they could see, instead of in device, but natural, you thank the doctor that helped you. But instead. As soon as they could see, they ran to the wall where there's a big painting of the grandfather of President Kim of North Korea and made worship, thank you, thank you, thank you, to that painting. Only a brainwashed people can do that. That's how sadly brainwashed you are. And Trump of the United States goes to Singapore to shake hands with this murderous Kim. Kim. But why? Because he possesses atomic bombs. This is a world governed by atomic bomb diplomacy, which is not diplomacy, it's coercion. When you think about the United Nations, uh, United Nations, 
Ang ganda-ganda, ang tunog. In the General Assembly of the United Nations, no matter how small your nation is, you have one vote equal to the vote of the most powerful nations on earth. But don't forget, don't ever forget, that the United Nations is controlled by a so-called 17-nation Security Council. And among those 17, there are 12 rotational members, but five permanent members. Five permanent members of the Security Council. The five are the United States, Russia, China, Great Britain, and France. Why do you suppose they're there? because they're the nations that possess the greatest number of atomic weapons. So therefore, if the General Assembly decides one thing, say Proposition A, approved by the General Assembly, if one of the five objects, it doesn't even have to be a majority, just one of the five objects, one of the five members of the permanent, the, uh, the permanent members of the Security Council, it's a no-go. So in other words, in the end, what the United Nations is, is simply ornamentation for the wishes of the five greatest, biggest nuclear power <coughs> possessing nations. It's really sad. And how the how has it happened? How did, how, how, how did it happen that uh, a result like that could get past the notice of the people standing alongside of the disciplinary assembly lines? Well, obviously, by getting them distracted. Getting them to be yeah, distracted, paying no attention at all. Playing only with brightly colored seashells while all this was going past them. Now, sadly, that's a picture of our world today. <clears throat> you know, all our the highly touted educational institutions of our world today, like our Harvards, our Yales, our London School of Economics, etc., etc., why do they have such huge endowments? I don't think USD has an endowment. <clears throat> But unlike Harvard or Yale or the University of Michigan or the University of Illinois, the big schools, the biggies, Princeton, they have huge endowments coming from the defense ministries of the world, particularly the U.S. defense ministry. In other words, that has gotten these schools to collaborate with them in the manufacture of weapons of mass destruction. So what does it mean to be in the top 10 schools in the world? Well, among the things it means that you have huge endowments for the defense ministries of the world. How was a result like that able to get past a people that supposedly are concerned only with the, the truth by keeping them distracted, by causing them to become simply docile and obedient and able to say only yes boss, to follow instructions, to obey commands. Which when you come to think of it is the meaning of a diploma. It's a certification by the school that this person is certified by us to be obedient to commands. And that's why all the Graduates interviewing for a job will speak just what I'm a people person. I, I will enrich your company, just <coughs> tell me what I must do and I'll do it. They sound all the same. Whether they graduate from the South or UST or Tele or whatever you be the Liman, it's the same. It's the same. And even in UP Dilman, where you have the, the hotbed of activism, so they'll march around the oval, march around saying, makibaka, makibaka, and then at the end of that, they'll go back to the classroom and continue their miseducation, continue their coercion into becoming these docile and obedient people who, after they graduate from the institution, can only say two things, yes, boss. And it's the same story over and over again. And so therefore, the first uh, 
really important institution, which is disciplinary, which is uh, sort of like uh, emblematic of our age in our times. It is a place where we first learn to how to write, where we first learn how to write, walk in a straight line, how we learn to sit in class, and as you are able to sit in class for two hours without moving, listening only to a lecture, <coughs> you learn it in school. But it's precisely the same disposition that enables the manufacture of weapons of mass destruction. Now, why do I keep talking about weapons of mass destruction? Well, in our own time, we have seen so many nations in the world. We have seen, in, because of the world wars, we have seen entire nations completely destroyed. It has happened before. It's happening still. It will happen massively again. This phenomenon of nations coming to be completely destroyed. You know, some years ago I was lucky enough to have gone around Turkey. First world Turkey. At first I was hesitant to go there. Why should I go there? I told my friends who were inviting me. You know, he said that a Muslim country, are they backward, etc., etc. Will I be able to get away from Turkey with my life intact and so forth and so on. So, okay, with much persuasion on their part, I finally went. And my jaw literally hit the floor when I saw what I saw. Turkey is a modern state, beautiful. Even more modern and more affluent than many European states. Certainly more affluent than Italy and Greece and Spain. And the country next door is Syria. And at the time, this is before the Syrian civil war, Syria, I was told, why did you go to visit Syria? It's just like Turkey. So, 10 years ago, Syria was just like Turkey, modern and sleek, where even the beggars dress in tuxedos. And the poor live in high-rise condos that will be the envy of the people that live in similar condos in PGC. I'm not exaggerating. Is there anyone else who's been to Turkey? And they said to me at the time, Syria is just like Turkey. That was 10 years ago. What is Syria today? Many Syrian cities do not have one stone upon another. Reduced to a rubble. It's a country that's completely devastated by war. And at the, even as I'm sitting here, how many countries in the world are slowly coming to be devastated by war? We can talk about Yemen. We can talk about the Sudan. We can talk, of course, there's Afghanistan and Iraq. And then Venezuela. And many African countries which are now, uh, you know, in the grip of an epidemic, an Ebola epidemic. Ebola a virus epidemic. Now, if you have that epidemic in far off Africa, well, there's every reason to think that someday soon it's going to come to the Philippines. And can you imagine what's going to happen in the Philippines if Ebola were ever to reach here? If Ebola was to hit, for example, one, any one of our crowded uh, squatter communities, or even our affluent families, and given the Filipino sort of like pension for taking care of the singular family. We're going to be a basket case. No, in other words, this is, you know, Pope Francis said recently that this is a world on the brink of the Third World War. That's why it's important to talk about weapons of mass destruction. Because these are weapons which, if unleashed, will mean the death of the human race. Right now, there's an incident between Taiwan, tension between Taiwan. Let, let's not talk about the China, because we don't have nuclear weapons. If ever, ever they unleash weapons at each other with the United States and China. But then there is a real problem with Taiwan and the United States. I, sorry, and China. So, I'm sure China has its nuclear weapons aimed at Taiwan, and then, of course, the United States is bound by treaty to come to the defense of Taiwan, so it has also weapons aimed at uh, they're going to destroy each other, and the Philippines is not far enough, so it will also be destroyed. And then Russia will come in, and 
God knows what's going to happen next. And why is it something to think about? Well, because we have allowed that situation to pass by us. We are not paying attention. Our school systems are designed precisely to get people not to pay attention. Okay, so that's one thing you... There are many, many things about school systems that you uh, become... You grow an aware, better awareness of by reading Foucault. But anyway, let's leave it at that. Then he looks at the prison. Prisons are an extreme form of loss of zoning. They are institutions that embody the jurisprudence of the land to impress upon people the fact that if you are not, if you overstep your compartment in the social grid, that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to end up in prison. That's the real function of prisons. To serve as a scarecrow. So that people do not overstep their appointed compartments in the social grid. Because if you do, you're going to end up in a place like the prison, which is, of course, made up to be really terrifying, horrible, a, a place of violence. <clears throat> a hellhole. I forget which prison it was, but some prison in Brazil, I think. But only recently, in the last two weeks, there were riots between gangs in the prison, inside the prison gangs. And one gang succeeded in decapitating 25 of the members of the opponent gang. Can you imagine that? You lose your head in a prison. And why were prisons widely established when they were established in the early 1800s? They were established on the assumption, on the proclamation that we have prisons now in order to eliminate, if not, or if not eliminate, at least reduce the amount of crime in society. That, that was the official reason why it is that prisons were started in the early days of what we call the disciplinary civilization. But clearly, very clearly, from the standpoint of the announced and widely proclaimed objective, the prison has been a failure, something which the critics of the prison uh, sort of like system have been saying from the very beginning, it's going to fail, it's going to fail, it's going to fail. It's true. With the establishment of the prison, there has been a greater amount of crime rather than lessening of crime. <coughs> the principal and only boast of Arnold Schwarzenegger when he stepped down as governor of California was that I, as governor, built the greatest number of prisons. So instead of reducing the amount of crime, it has actually allowed crime to proliferate. And how has crime proliferated? Well, for the most part, it's because of repeat offense, recidivism. And why, can't, why should there not be recidivism? We have a practice where, you know, if you're a prisoner and you have served time, and when you are released, you have to have, in our case, you, you cannot get the police clearance. And there's almost no family that we know that's willing to hire someone who cannot produce a police clearance. So what are these people supposed to do? They have already served their time, maybe they've learned their lesson, but then they come to a world which does not want them, which rejects them. So what do they do? Did they find the next meal from a garbage can only? Well, they can do that. But after several months of eating only food, leftover food in garbage cans, you get tired. 
So what you do is you say to yourself, where was the place where I got at least three filthy meals a day, but at least there were three? In prison. So I'll commit crime again in order to go back to prison. That's a very common thing, recidivism. And then in prisons, you know, you uh, basically tend to develop uh, a culture. That's why every body that turns up of a former prisoner in the Pasig River bears a tattoo marks either of the Sputnik gang or the Sige Sige gang or the Batak City Jail gang. They, they form partnerships, fraternities. And then we also have our friends. They're, they're no different when you come to think of it. The crime families. <laughs> no, I mean, that's true. They are a crime family. They're not brotherhoods. They're just crime families. So, but, but in, you know, in, uh, so Michel Foucault says many, many other things about prisons. How they precisely do not attain to their announced objectives, which basically have to do with the elimination, if not the reduction, of the incidence of crime. But Michel, and, and to that, Michel Foucault says, will you please stop thinking about the fact that the prison has been a failure. Because if that's the way you think, then nakakaloka. I mean, you're thinking, why is it that we stay with the prison arrangement still, despite the fact that it so clearly has been a failure? Nakakaloka if you think that way. No, rather, think of it this way. The failure of the prison. Ano ang service? What service did it perform? So, for example, concerning that, this is what Michel Foucault has to say. He says, One should reverse the problem and ask oneself, why, what is served by the failure of the prison? What is the use of all these different phenomena which we continually criticize? So for example, the prison system maintains delinquency, it encourages recidivism, the transformation of the occasional offender makes him a habitual delinquent or criminal, the organization of a close milieu of delinquency, the fraternities in prison. So the question is, we should stop asking how do we continue to maintain all of the fun. Let us ask instead why the prison and no doubt punishment in general is not intended to eliminate offenses but instead to distinguish them, to distribute them, to use them. That is not so much that they render docile those who are able to transgress, those who are liable to transgress the law, but that they send, but they rather they tend to assimilate the transgression of the laws in the general tactics of subjection. So penality or the prison technology or the prison, the penal institution, would then appear to be a way of handling illegalities, of laying down the limits of tolerance, of giving free reign to some, of putting pressure on others of excluding a particular section and of rendering another useful, of neutralizing certain <laughs> individuals and of profiting from others. In short, penality does not simply check illegalities, it differentiates them, it provides them with a general economy. So in other words, Michel Foucault looks at the penal institution and ipso facto, the jurisprudence of the land that establishes the penal institution, and basically says it's a method of control. So the penal institution is established not so much to eliminate crime, but it, it's established to affect the various territories and sub-territories of administrative 
So that's how he, it, the argument ends more or less about the dispersionization of bankrupt it is. How it, how so much darkness attends its uh, limits. How when you follow it all the way to the end, it's a bitter end and you're facing a wall. And you cannot go beyond the wall. So in this book, he makes that point about the disciplinary civilization, about our civilization, from the standpoint of two of its most pervasive institutions, namely our school systems and our prison systems, and therefore our jurisprudence. Our jurisprudence, its main purpose is to lend support and to guarantee the longevity, precisely, of a social grid which is very, very unjust and unequal. Like I said in the beginning, it's a form of zoning. If you're caught in a compartment which is not your own, you go to prison. That is all thing. If a person insists on coming into your USD who is not properly dressed, if he keeps insisting, he ends up in prison. That is all thing. Okay, so that's the argument he makes about the first two institutions, our school system. By way of example, in our prison systems. And then the history of sexuality is about the deployments the man of sexuality. Sexuality becomes a means by which we affect again, once again, the territories of and sub-territories of control. Now it's important to take this into account because of the fact that most people take it to be the case that their sexuality is a non-negotiable, it's a thing of nature. What Michel Foucault he seems to be saying is, no, sexuality is not a thing of nature, it's a thing that, that left on the ground is a thing of negotiation. Sure, there is definitely biological males, biological, you're bi biologically one thing or another or another or another. There are hermaphrodites also. So in other words, biologically you could be male, female, or hermaphrodite, or left of hermaphrodite, right of hermaphrodite, etc., etc. And so therefore, you, you're, the, the, the only thing you can do about that is to negotiate with the people around you. As to what my particular physical sexuality should mean to you, you have to negotiate. But that you can negotiate only for as long as the matter is left on the ground. <coughs> left on the ground in the the thick of negotiation, sometimes you get what you want, sometimes you don't get what you want, etc., etc. Disciplinarity is about not allowing for negotiation to take place on the ground because it is subsumed under scientific principle. But that's the crucial part. What do you mean by a scientific principle? Do you mean objective science or do you mean fake science? What Michel Foucault seems to be saying about this is about uh, the deployments of sexuality which were not allowed, you know, sort of like uh, sexual difference which is not allowed to be uh, the subject of negotiation on the ground, precisely because it was lifted up and brought to a level that it could be wrapped around with fake scientificity. And on the basis of this fake scientificity, become like universal law. That 
that's the situation with the deployments of sexuality. So Foucault is not denying sexual difference. What he is calling into question is a science that is wrapped around like a protective veil around sexual difference. And the question we must ask about the protective veil, is it real or is it fake? And his point is that it is mostly fake. You know, apropos to that, he says one thing in this book, The Nature of Sexuality. He says, uh, and let me read it to you. Throughout the 19th century, sex seems to have been incorporated into two very distinct orders of knowledge. The first is a biology of reproduction, which developed continuously according to a general scientific normativity. By this biology of reproduction, it simply means to say the application of the scientific method, as we understand the scientific method, beginning with physical observation, discussion amongst people as to what kind of experimentation, you know, we have to submit the things which you have observed to in order to gain more clarity. And then once that experimentation is done, then therefore, uh, you know, the generation hypotheses, if uh, the claimed results by some people uh, are borne out, etc., etc. That's scientific, that is the biology of reproduction, the scientific method. But notice, the scientific method, when correctly applied, is social, communal. It's not, the scientific method is not uh, operated on the say-so of just one person, but of a community, the scientific community. So in other words, science is just like economics, it's just like philosophy, it is the result of dialogue. The other day, I understand you had a session of Martin Buber, the philosopher of dialogue. Well, science is also dialogue. Economics is also dialogue. When, when science and economics forget that they are products of dialogue, then that's a problem. So anyway, the biology production is one order of knowledge which develops continuously. In other words, it's since the time of Aristotle, the scientific method. So then there occurred in the early part of the 1800s what he calls a medicine of sex corresponding to different rules of formation. And between them, there was no real exchange, no real reciprocity. The role of the scientific method of the biology reduction in relation to the medicine of sex was to simply to provide something of a fictitious guarantee. A blanket guarantee, this is now the scientific method, the biology of production providing the blanket guarantee to the medicine of sex under cover of which all kinds of traditional fears could be recast in a scientific sounding vocabulary. And the aim of such a discourse, the resulting discourse, the medicine of sex wrapped around with the fictitious guarantee of the scientific method, the aim of such a discourse was not to state the truth, but to prevent its very emergence. Whereas the scientific method, the, the biology reduction, 
participated, could partake of the immense will to know, to knowledge. The medicine of sex would derive rather from a stubborn will to non-knowledge. So this much is undeniable. The learned discourse on sex that was pronounced in the 19th century really was imbued with age-old delusions and systematic blindnesses. It was characterized by a refusal to see and to understand. Choosing not to recognize became yet another version, another form of the will to truth. Okay, so that's what he says. So in other words, the implication is that the so-called deployments of sexuality really have no scientific base. Only a fictitious guarantee from science. And for the most part, a fictitious guarantee that was forced from science by the fictitious... <clears throat> like, for example, what the, what's one of the deployments of sexuality? One of the deployments of sexuality he calls the historization of feminine behavior. Now, what does hysterization refer to? The root word of the word hysterization is hystera. Now, hystera is the Greek word for uterus, the life-giving uh, organ in a woman's body. So therefore, by the hysterization of women's bodies, he means that uh, one of the diplomas of sexuality basically uh, reproduces mothering as a main purpose of the female existence to reproduce mothering. <clears throat> that women are mainly good for only childbearing and the care of small children. Now that immediately takes women away from so many things. If you remember, that's what Plato tried to correct in Book 5 of the Republic. Because in Plato, for him, the important thing, the most important thing is talent and the development of talent. It's not a function of gender. It doesn't matter that you're male and female. The only thing that matters is that you possess talent. And God knows that the city needs the operation of talent. And God also knows that the, the male, the biological male class in the city does not have enough talent in its possession. So therefore, in order to uh, get the talent that the city requires, you also have to look into the other half. That was Plato. And precisely, when you found talent in the other half, you take both the male and the female who have talent, and you prevent them from starting their own families. You separate them from the work of reproduction. Even the women who you discover have talent. Let them make sure, make sure that they have nothing to do with reproduction. That was Plato. And we who belong, who <laughs> we should understand that. Maybe the rest of the world may not always agree with us. But after all, we still demand of our priests and nuns that they be celibate, don't we? So we should understand that. I mean, it's not for the best reason that we demand that they be celibate, but we do. So we should be able to understand why Plato demands also that the possessors of talent, whether they male or female, remain not exactly celibate, but at least they don't start their own families. Yes? Um, yeah, I, I totally agree, Father. But isn't it that there are certain institutions or systems that doesn't allow us to negotiate? Otherwise, the way to your hell will be paved with many good intentions, but nevertheless lead to hell. So, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the situation with our country today. Everybody talks about small things, small goods, my private interest. There's hardly any attention paid to the common good. Are there any other questions?
Yes. Sir, uh, in the book two of uh, book three of the Republic, there about the education of the guardians. Uh, there seems to be sir a distillation of the ones that will be studied by the soldiers, specifically on matters pertaining to literature. Uh, and in some way, Plato seems to, in a way, lambast the uh, literature Homer and Keisha. Uh, what do, what do, uh, is Plato trying to dismiss or trying to... Well, first of all, Plato in, uh, remember, he's talking about guardians who have started out very young and who as minors really don't know the whole story yet. And so maybe if you're a good professor, if you're a good teacher, and you try to complete your, you know, the, the perception of things that young people have, which is very incomplete. So Plato may seem to be prescriptive, very directive at this point. But he's basically just, uh, you know, saying what we, I mean, he's basically uh, treating of a subject that we all know about. In other words, that when a person is very young, naturally older ones who have more experience would be expected to stand in. Now, when it comes to Homer and the poets, well, that's an example precisely of why Plato said, I want my gardeners to learn not to imitate fictions. Now, Homer was represented precisely in his own type of fiction makers. He invented the Iliad and the Odyssey. The story of how even the gods and goddesses are just like, uh, you know, sordid men and women. So, in other words, Homer was a popularized, he, he wrote popular literature. <coughs> he wrote uh, X-Men, he wrote people, things like that. He wrote Harry Potter. You know, I mean, he wrote like, the kinds of, about the kinds of things which had great popular appeal, but really were of no value. So be able to distinguish between uh, the writer of Harry Potter and Harry Potter and, uh, say, the writer of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, with the one being a great epic, the other thing being uh, entertainment fluff. Be able to distinguish. I mean, one, can, one has the potential to help people to become better selves. The other, I mean, it's just an afternoon's worth of entertainment. So the, the, the Plato was very down on Homer and the poets precisely because in his time, the poets were symbols precisely of uh, fiction writers who created fictions that were of no help to people. In other words, uh, Plato had said, you know, you know, learn, teach your guardians, teach your people, you know, to love only the truth and nothing but the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But you don't find that in Homer. There's no God in Homer who is not deceitful. So, whereas Plato believed that if God be God, then he couldn't be deceitful. So uh, that's, why he, that's why he says, I will not allow poets in my republic. I mean, he means that. I will not allow fiction writers in my republic. Not that Plato was completely, uh, you know, doer and like a Puritan and so forth and so on, and there's no joy or laughter in his life. Of course there was. He was, uh, I mean, for example, when he, when he said, you know, when, when the guardians came home victorious in battle, he said, give them a reward. Let them have sex with one another for three days. Recreational sex. And let them have anyone they want. If they want another man, if they're a man, they want that, let them. So long as uh, there's con mutual consent. If they want heterosexual, but then, and if, and if children uh, uh, result from uh, heterosexual couplings and so forth and so on, make sure that they are correctly brought up, but in state and state nurseries, not in nuclear families. Because precisely, if a person was a member of the guardian class, that means to say we need his or her talent for the running of the city. Otherwise, jumbo jets will crash if there are no airport control tower technicians doing the job. What's more important, uh, that uh, one baby be fed an afternoon's worth of a mother's milk or that jumbo jets do not crash? So, so, so Plato says, you know, put things in perspective, Naman. If you want a well-working city, well -working city, well, some people have to be, uh, should have to be dedicated exclusively to that kind of job, to the operation of talent for the benefit of the city as a whole.
even to the exclusion, for example, of family, bringing, of family life, bringing up a nuclear family. That's not as important. And as I said, you know, more than any other group right now, it will be members of the Catholic Church. It should understand that. Requiring, for example, of his priests and nuns and so forth and so on to live lives in which they do not focus on a small family, nuclear family. But even that is debatable, as I said. A question like that should be left on the ground for people to negotiate rather than be, become something that is determined or ruled simply by scientific statements, which are supposedly are taken to be universal statements, and actually they're not. You know, that's, that's the, uh, you know, that's the terrible fact that results from impure science. I mean, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis believed they were serving science. If they eliminated Jewish people and other targeted races, it's because they believed the Nazis and Adolf Hitler believed that these were contaminated races that we had to get rid of, you know, in preparation for the coming of the super Aryan race. So they believed they were serving science. They believed they were serving a noble thing. But the thing is, though, their belief was based only on conjecture, only on speculation, not on the hard facts that come from the ground through observation. Because if they had only observed things carefully, they would have come to the realization, my God, these people I'm seeking to make you, but they were our neighbors. Their, their children went to school, the same schools that our children went to. We borrowed a cup of sugar from them. They would have remembered history, their historical uh, uh, community together. But instead, they chose to forget that history in favor of a spec uh, something based, a, a totally theorism based on speculation and conjecture. Yeah, Father, that remark you said from observation. Yes. From observation, from historical experience. It can be deduced, no? Well, it can be uh, sort of like remembered Remember. from historical experience. In the same way that I assume that every Mass for us is efficacious because we remember what Jesus did at every Mass. It's a question of memory. Reliving a Re, uh, reliving a memory. That's what it is. Which, that's what inspires us in a sense to make of our lives cruciform. And now let us proclaim the sacrament. It is a sacrament. The Mass is a sacrament of faith. It's, uh, and what is a sacrament? It's water, wine, bread, oil, words, hands, the hands of the bishop imposed upon the head of the priest in holy orders. Very concrete material things. But you know, so, so uh, if you leave the world of very concrete material things for the world of, and exchange it for the world of speculation only and conjecture, you're bound to create horrors. Uh, Father, I'm interested in the, uh, the remark that you said about teach the young man to love too hard. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, as it is now, there seems to be a crisis in, uh, of uh, mediocrity. People are too fond of uh, showtime, these things. Uh, yeah, how, how, how in these readings may, or how as a teacher, may, or, uh, may, 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 may we be able to articulate on, on, on uh, the students not, uh, not allowing themselves to not go hard. Well, I mean, you can begin by asking them how much time since they were infants have they spent with their computers, Facebook accounts, cell phones, etc., etc., all of which pervade fantasy. You know, fantasy games, fantasy, whatever, communication, kunwari, I'm uh, uh, making a revelation myself, but it's actually all a lie. I mean, do you tell the truth about yourself on your Facebook accounts? I mean, do people become more uh, better communicators just because they participate in social media or they become better at concealing themselves? You know, so you ask your students, when you participate in a social media platform, is it because 
you want to make a revelation which is uh, you know hard made and hard uh, you know express about yourself or is it because you want to conceal yourself more and confuse the other even texting is, is texting the same thing as uh, you know, getting on the internet is it the same thing as participating and getting uh, better at uh, improving your skills of communication or is it uh, an exercise instead in uh, miscommunication in uh, in uh, in, uh, in uh, subterfuge rather than in direct speech you know as another philosopher who's very important and very good to learn uh, has said you know to Hannah Arendt you know she said you know the trouble is we live in a world in which speech has lost its meaning already and she wrote those very words at around the same time that Simon and Garfunkel wrote their song Sounds of Silence over 50 years ago, 70 years ago. And because we live in a world in which speech has lost its meaning, we only have world wars. And the language of who owns a the most number of nuclear weapons. So hands of friendship are shown because the owners of those hands that are clasped are also the owners of nuclear weapons. Such is the world in which we live. And such, unfortunately, are, is, that is the kind of world which our education institutions you know, have to prepare young people for in order to participate in it. I mean, we're so hung up about you know, appearing in the <coughs> world index of the top colleges and universities. But what do the top colleges and universities really do if not lend support to the manufacture of weapons of mass destruction? It's, not, it's better not to appear on such a list at all than ever to appear on such a list. And yet our school administrators are so desperately wanting to be on the list. They don't realize what, what it really is telling the world to be on such a list. So, so that's, what, uh, that's, uh, that's the sorry state of affairs. I mean, we may not be directly uh, involved in the production of actual weapons of mass destruction, but we certainly uh, produce people who will be in their own capacity. If they happen to go overseas or whatever, or get uh, join the US Army, even if they're Filipino and so forth and so on, you know, they, they, they get involved in that sort of thing. And we prepare them for it. So in other words, uh, well, what kinds of things can we, well, I, what's very important is, you know, decide the, on the most important social questions to have your high school students ask today. And then find the philosophical discourse or narrative or language or terminology that makes you, enables the student to ask pertinent questions along those lines. To provide answers, maybe using some of the terminology, some of the vocabulary that the writer that you have uh, found or discovered is able to provide. Maybe that's a way to. So, in other words, uh, start with an important social question, and then dress it up with a technology, with the terminology of some writer that you come across that will be germane to the subject, rather than start with a subject and then try to force out of it a social question. I don't, I, I don't think it's very helpful to do it in three. Start with a social question. And from your experience, you know, decide which uh, philosopher or writer you have read um, lends himself or herself the most to posing the right kinds of questions in the right sort of way. Maybe that might be one tactic to deploy. Uh, just a uh, comment or uh, I think this is just a reaction. Uh, no, 
nung panahon po na ako siguro yung nasa edad ng mga estudyante ko, I was already taking up major subjects in philosophy. Uh, and uh, the students nowadays, mga 16 to 18 years old, uh, they are far beyond doon sa kung ano kami or kung ano po tayo noong edad natin ganun. Kaya ang hirap dahil... Beyond or behind? Uh, they are behind. Super. <laughs> uh, most of the time, uh, I'm teaching them, of course, uh, my coordinators, our uh, academic coordinators, always telling me that I'm, I'm almost advocating something on them na palagi na lang daw akong kinukote ng mga students. Uh, I don't think if it's a praise or it's a warning for me. Then whenever I teach, uh, of course, I'm inculcating in them uh, the church's teachings and uh, philosophies or other stuff that might help them improve uh, because I was taught to be a uh, pragmatic humanist. And the problem is I'm always quoted by the students. I'm always misquoted by the students. Kaya parang yung pagtuturo po ngayon sa senior high school, hindi natin sila pwedeng basta i-open sa, sa kung ano yung nasa environment nang hindi sila, or rather, nang hindi aware ang mga magulang nila. Then even the schools are very protective. Ayaw nilang maging, minsan, ayaw nilang maging, maging bukas at maging vocal yung mga students. Especially in one uh, instance, uh, there was a student who committed, of course, a uh, very grave incident, a uh, grave action. Nagkaroon siya ng sex scandal, may video. And, of course, kung si, si, kahit sino naman po sa atin, alam po natin ang parusa sa mga batang gano'n. Ano po ba ang sa inyo, sir? expansion for uh, being in the Catholic school I uh, I was asked by my, by my students Sir ano po ba dapat ang gawin natin sa ganun tama po ba na bigla na lang nilang pinaalis dahil inamin ng bata na siya yung nasa video and I told them if we will be true Catholics if we will be true Christians followers of Christ we should be like uh, the apostles we should be like Christ who who embrace the cross Dahil sa pagpapa sa pagpapaalis natin sa estudyante, makikita natin doon na nawalan tayo ng concern na dapat mas tinuturuan na natin siya. Na dapat mas niyakap natin siya doon sa kahinaan niya. And ang nangyayari parang whenever I speak something na hindi naman agit but kumbaga ay tama, Tama, in a sense na pinag-reflectan ko, pinag-nilayan ko, tama ba itong sasabihin ko or hindi. Pero ang nangyayari po ay bakit mali lagi yung tingin kapag tama na yung pinag-uusapan natin, especially sa mga estudyante natin na uh, sa mga age nila ngayon, claiming that they are millennials, even they are not. Hindi na sila kasama sa bracket. Uh, medyo nalalayo ako dun sa, sa ano ko. Pero I just want to I just, I just really want to share this. Dahil nga, mahirap bilang uh, senior high school students, kami ng mga teachers, ilang teachers dito na uh, sabihin na natin collateral damage ng K-12 program. Teaching sa college department na mga ibinaba sa senior high school. Para po sa ganito. Uh, ayun nga po, paano po ba dapat natin sila atakihin? Yes, then most of the times, lagi nga po akong niloloko ng mga teachers. Sir, mas malimit ka pa sa principal's office kesa sa mga pasaway ng sadyante. Dahil students are always quoting me and the administrators, nakikita nila sa social media, ano na naman yung sinabi ko sa classroom. Kung bagay, lagi na lang silang misled kahit malinaw yung sinasabi ko. Yeah. Shit, shit. Uh, 
uh, apropos, I think, to the, the situation you brought up, well, I suppose a, a school has uh, the right to make to pass judgment on something that has been uh, brought out into a, a public forum. Okay, so I mean, when you when the, the state when a, a sex video becomes public, I mean, it, it already moves into the public uh, sphere, and uh, so there are sanctions for that. But I mean, say you're right. I mean, the attitude towards uh, uh, I mean the Christian the correct uh, you know like uh, attitude towards uh, private pleasures as opposed to uh, supporting a public good should be one okay should be one of all right. I mean, let's assume that people are having great fun privately. Let's not be judgmental about it. But what's more important is to ask the question: What are people also doing about you know? Public goods about politics. They're having only private pleasures, but they do not participate in politics, and they they should be penalized for that. I mean, to say in class, we should tell them, you know, you you're not being good citizens. I mean, what what you do under the bed sheets? I mean, that's your own business. We're not gonna <laughs> you can pass judgment on that. But on the other hand, are you doing anything other? Uh, uh, are you doing other things besides having fun under the bed sheets? Are you, for example, uh, you know, also helping to promote, uh, you know, history and politics and philosophy, which are public, which are higher order goods, as opposed to those very lower. I mean, even the birds and the bees do it anyway. So why, why, uh, you know, why make a big thing about what birds and bees and flowers and trees? What, what we should make a big thing about is what people are not doing for the public sphere. And it's clear that in a world in which speech has lost its meaning, people precisely are not doing what they should be doing for the public sphere. And that should be the concern of the institution. Not the, the concern of a Catholic institution should not be to promote private morality, but rather public service. That's what, that's what a Catholic institution should be concerned about. Making sure that all its constituencies take public service and that they ought to rather take it very seriously. <coughs> Instead of moralize about, you know, what people do under the sheets. So that, that, that's why Foucault, you know, and why, why do we focus on that? Because there is official teaching that amounts to universal law. That amounts to like scientific law. It's not exactly scientific law, but it like amounts to something like it. We should be less concerned about that than about in our classrooms and in every way that we can promoting a concern for the common good, the good of uh, of communities, of actual communities around which we, in fact, can wrap our minds around. Not a mythical community like a big republic of the Philippines from Apari to Hondo. We cannot wrap our minds around that. But we can wrap our minds around maybe uh, the section of Metro Manila in which we live. What, what, what good is being done by people for the, that sector of the city? That's as public as you can get, really. So get, get your students to reflect on that part of the city in which they belong to and what it is that they're doing to make things and life better for the people who live in that part of the city. That, I think, is the greatest good that you can do at this moment. And uh, don't, don't, uh, you know, don't be surprised that at, uh, at your same, same age, you know, maybe even older, that in a sense they seem to be more juvenile because uh, they're too attached to their gadgets which keep them juvenile. Like even on Valentine's Day, you'll see all these couples, you know, romancing each other over dinner, but they're not really romancing each other, they're only texting. They're not even looking at each other. It's, it's very ironic, you know, I mean, say they, they go out, you know, on a date, but then they spend all their time just texting other people. That's, that's how bad it is that we've made ourselves into a society in which already speech has lost its meaning. 
Let's say, get your students to memorize the song, Sounds of Silence. Get them to memorize the song, Eleanor Rigby. Get them to memorize the poem by T.S. Eliot, Hollow Men. And to reflect upon the words. We are the hollow men, we are the stuffed men, we have had pieces filled only with straw. Running over, running with broken feet over glass in our rat cellar. That's how we are. This is a technical concern for yeah. you, and also perhaps a question. Uh, since uh, <coughs> this uh, course on philosophical anthropology, um, can you further elaborate what the concept pharisia? I guess this notion of sexuality, recovery of passion. No, the, pharisia, the, 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 the idea of pharisia is you speak the truth, but you know people can only speak the truth if they truly are wedded to experience. If they, are. if they are, you know, connected to experience. I mean, how can you speak a truth which is only speculative or conjecture? Because speaking the truth means uh, being fearless even in the face of possible harm to yourself for speaking the truth, but then you have to speak it because all the signs show that you have to speak it. And that is to say if you're correctly reading the signs. So the Parasias is a good citizen who is plugged into everything. Who, in other words, uh, uh, is for the common good, is able to know when one has to be able, to, when one has to suffer the devil for the sake of the common good. If for the sake of buying time for the people, you know, to uh, for the sake of distracting uh, the gaze of the enemy from the people, you know, to sort of like uh, entertain the the enemy with all kinds of deceptions, that is Parisia. And the thing is, is to know when to do it and how to do it. The Parisias knows what to do and when to do it and how to say it. But can only know those things from experience. So the Parisias is engaged, is involved, is uh, uh, willing to run hither and thither for the sake of uh, Developing a greater acquaintance with the context in which he operates. And uh, as a result of that greater acquaintance, to decide what under the circumstances might be best for me to do, even if it could be dangerous. The, the, the precious is willing to risk personal danger because he knows what is at stake. That if he doesn't move, that if he doesn't say anything, worse things could happen. Yes? Father, in, um, in relation to the question of Parisia, uh, one of the things that he mentioned uh, in the text, uh, let me just read it to page 15. In the Greek conception of Parisia, there does not seem to have a problem about the acquisition of the truth since such truth having is guaranteed by the possession of certain moral qualities. So what he meant by that is the frankness of telling the truth. The requisite for that is possessing moral qualities. But it seems to me when I read the other passages in the text, this wasn't clear enough what we mean by moral qualities here. Well, the, well moral qualities, like <coughs> Aristotle talks, for example, about virtues, but you know, the, the possession of virtues is always an only work in progress. You're never completely temperate, you're never completely generous, you're never completely magnificent or magnanimous and so forth and so on, but uh, you're always on the way to being so. And so is the Parisias, he's always on the way to being so. He's never a, uh, he never finds it, he never gets to his destination in his life, but as much as he can, he remains warm on the trail. He remain warm, remains warm on the trail. So, uh, so in other words, uh, the Parisias, in a sense, uh, is willing to risk speaking the truth even if not the whole jury has come in with the decision. But he's willing to risk it, speaking it anyway. That's why there is the possibility of 
uh, danger to him for speaking it precisely because he doesn't have all the facts in. But when is he ever going to get the facts, all the facts in? So I mean, is he going to act only when he has? Well, that means to say that he'll not act at all. So, so in other words, uh, the, uh, the possession of moral qualities, in the way Foucault puts it, is uh, it's in the sense of the work in progress. You're never completely already there, but you're getting there. Do you think that's also a problem in contemporary human society where there's the emergence of new populism, speech is becoming, or, you know, frankness, even though they claim it's actually truth, it's actually not truth, so... The, well, but the, you can only know that if you make your way around. You, you, that, can, you can tell the difference between, uh, say, someone saying, uh, I'll kill you every or the line, and someone who in a sense is willing to in fact engage in terrible behavior for the sake of the community. There's a difference. There's a difference between someone who for the sake of uh, defending the city will be willing to kill a dozen men, and someone who just says, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, just for the heck of it. Who makes a joke out of it. The one who's willing to kill a dozen men for the sake of the defense of the city never makes a joke of it. Because it's not easy to do. In fact, it's not the right thing. You, you feel it's not the right thing to do, but you have to do it. If your city is to be defended. So that's the position of the Parasias. This is very different. He's, the Parasias is always between a rock and a hard place. You know, you're never at the point where uh, you can correctly say that, uh, you know, I have done no wrong. You cannot say that as a Parisian. But you're willing to say it all the same. Because if you don't say it, your city will have to suffer. I don't want to, I, I see, is that correct? Uh, ten more minutes, huh? You said correct, until two, yes. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep you only until two. Or I have to go on two, maybe. To put it more truthfully. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Did, did I see I go up there? Uh, you want to give some questions about specific topics or specific texts? What's going to happen after this? A big old guy. Maybe a workshop? Ah, oh, you have a workshop still. <coughs> now, the important thing is if you, if, you, if in any way uh, some of the subjects that were brought up this morning were, became, came to be of uh, some interest to you, is you have to read the text. You know, very few people have actually read the Republic from cover to cover. They may have read parts of it. Maybe parts of it were presented in one class or another that you had to take. Maybe the Allegor of the Cave uh, would be the best example. Most everybody would have at least read that. But you have not read, chances are, you know, you would not have read all of the Republic. And I think this is a shame. And much uh, less so the loss of Plato. The book that we tend to see. I think you should. I mean, it, 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 it's important you, you became really closely acquainted with the text. And then, when you've read the two major books by Plato, then go back to what dialogues you know and reread those dialogues. And maybe you'll see those dialogues in, different, in a slightly different or a radically different light. Same thing with Michel Foucault. You've heard a lot about him, now is finally the time maybe for many of you to start to read him. But when you read Michel Foucault, don't start with difficult works like the Archaeology of Knowledge or the Order of Things. No, start with doables, like what I told you about this punish, that's doable. It's a very interesting uh, sort of like quasi-historical account that he gives of the disciplinary civilization. No, 
Now, the history of sexuality in, 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 in is in the volume one is a little harder to read because it was meant by Foucault only as an introduction, a prolonged introduction to a seven volume work on the history of sexuality, which he never wrote. So, beyond the introductory volume, he did not write volumes two, three, four, five, six, etc. Well, the reason for it, I suspect, is because uh, in order to prepare himself to do that sort of writing, to do that sort of work, you know, he was a very fastidious researcher. So he conducted a lot of research over many years, but the more research he conducted, the further back he went. Until he got to the point where he was doing already Plato. He had gone through the Roman Republic, all the way to the back to the Christian Koinonia, and then even all the way back to ancient Athens. All three societies being pre-disciplinary societies. There was no disciplinary yet. Disciplinarity is a phenomenon which uh, uh, sort of materialized only in the 1800s. And then he must have told himself, you know, these are very interesting communities. They have left voluminous testimony as to what they uh, did to uh, cope with emergencies, with, with tensions, with uh, social tensions. They left uh, voluminous written records about themselves. And besides, he was going to write a book on each of the deployments, you know, one book on the historicization of feminine behavior, one book on the pedagogization of children's sex. But then he decided, you know, why should I reinvent the wheel? Other people are doing writing anyway along those lines. So that is why the project of the history of sexuality, the seven volume project, never got off the board, with the exception of the introduction. He became involved instead with the writing of the use of pleasure and the care of the self, which are books which are called named to what I was talking about the way through. Then it was at that time that he got sick. While he was working on the third book in the series, The Chair of the Flesh, about the early Christian koinonia. But, well, he died before he could finish it. Although enough of it got written, and enough of uh, the themes that appear in it got uh, uh, sort of like developed by Michel Foucault in other lectures and writings and interviews that he gave, that we more or less could, can guess what it is that he wanted to convey in that book. And as far as I know, that book has already been published. <laughs> Michel Foucault, before he died, he left instructions that that book was never to be published because it was yet unfinished. But like all the rest of his writings, it came, he went into the family estate, you know, which his relatives inherited. And uh, last year, or two years ago, the relatives decided, okay, go ahead and publish it if you want. They gave permission. And then also there were the cognate uh, lectures that he gave at the Collège de France. <coughs> even as he was writing these works, he was giving uh, related lectures at the same time at the Collège de France. And those lectures have been published as books. So look particularly at the, the lectures he gave. The, uh, the last set of lectures he gave was, uh, were lectures he gave from the years 82 to 83, and then 81 to 82 also. Those two years' worth of lectures would be very much culminated to what we were just saying about Parisia. Then he gave the special six lectures he prepared for a delivery at the University of California in Berkeley. And then he got sick. Now remember, uh, he had already uh, finished writing The Use of Pleasure and the Care of the Self. But the thing is, he had as yet no contract for those two books for, as a series. He already had the contract for The History of Sexuality, also as a series for the earlier History of Sexuality, but he knew he was very sick. Of course, he didn't expect to die when he died, exactly when he died. But just to make sure, he saw through the publication, the two books, The Use of Pleasure and The Care of the Self, and rather than apply for a new contract, he decided he would use the former contract. 
And so that is why the use of pleasure and the care of the self very often are also called volume 2 and volume 3 of the history of sexuality, although they're not part of the exact same series. But I mention that because uh, that maybe might explain the fact that the volume 1 is not easy to read. Because it's a, he was going to further explicitate the, the meaning of many of the things he brings up in, volume, in the introductory volume, volume 1. But he never did. But nevertheless, there remains, it's a very long introduction, it's an unusually long intro introduction. Containing uh, uh, a lot of information, so there's a lot of information conveyed by that thin book, the introduction. But anyway, as I said, reading *This of Punish and Volume 1 of The History of Sexuality together uh, as, uh, a, as, testament, as a testament to his uh, critical interrogation of what we call disciplinarity, our modern way of life. They ought to be read together, and they're relatively easy to read when read together. So the same point, the same critical points that he makes about school systems are the same critical points, similar critical points which he makes about the peer institutions and the jurisprudence are similar points which he makes concerning based on sexuality. Only there, there is, however, a difference in that. In the case of the first two, the school systems and the penal institution and jurisprudence, these are phenomena which sort of like originate on the outside and come into a person. So out in. But in the case of the diplomacy of sexuality, the myth is uh, parlayed that the sexual identity formations are not cobbled outside, but, but spring from within our natures. Although in point of fact, they were cobbled outside. And then introjected into us. In such a way as to make us believe that they are our natures. But anyway, whatever, so it does it. The, the first two that he criticizes, the school systems and the, and the penal systems, are examples of out-in. The history of sexuality is about the diplomacy of sexuality, which are mythologized to us as being simply in. Which reminds me of that song, by, it's a, the, made into a song, the poem of C.S. Lewis, in which one line that occurs is, not even the rain has such small hands. The deployments of sexuality is like that. They have hands so small that not even the rain in a shower, for example, has such small hands. Now the upshot of, like I said, of the critical points that Foucault makes of the three uh, disciplinary institutions is that we are now left facing a wall beyond which there is, can be no progress. We're, we're, we've hit the wall. So if you stop simply with the argument in those two books, then you stop just at the wall. The further book, The, the Use of Pleasure, is really a an invitation for you to consider that yes, you can, actually there are spaces in the wall. <coughs> there is there, there, it's like, uh, well, maybe if you use the Harry Potter image, you can go through the wall. But like Nietzsche had said, you can go across only after you have gone down. You can move forward only if <coughs> you have already cared for yourself. So that's, that's the development of the Foucauldian argument in the last three books that he wrote and then the cognitive lectures he gave at the Collège de France and the six lectures that he gave on Paris. So anyway, uh, just uh, 
the, the, the invitation for you is to develop a better acquaintance of these works by actually taking them up and reading. And you know, on the internet you'll find some helpful uh, commentary. So if uh, you know you stumble along as you're reading Foucault the the original, then you commentary and sort of you read back and forth, back and forth. And I think you have had enough exposure to philosophy to know when a commentary is fairly good and when it is garbage. Now when you know that you, know, you feel that the commentary is garbage, don't well, I mean to say don't bug nyong punch in. Just go and just get rid of it and look for another commentary that is more helpful. Okay, that's the most I can do in one afternoon uh, by way of uh, whetting your appetite for both uh, Plato, a very good philosopher, to always have around you whatever else you might be doing in philosophy. And, uh, well, Michel Foucault is more, a, shall we say, a, a commentator of our own contemporary times. And so he would be more uh, contemporary, in a way. And uh, what both Plato and Michel Foucault basically, uh, you know, uh, call attention to is the importance of circulating in a context that we in fact can wrap our minds around, that is to say the context of the small. Whether it be the, the practice of democracy, the practice of citizenship, etc., etc., always it is good to walk around, canvas around in the context and the environment of the small. Never mind the big, the big will take care of itself. It's a, it, We've already made arrangements for the big to take care of itself. That's the meaning of our large modern republics. Let's pay attention now as well at the same time to the small. Okay, so thank you. So this is how we end. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, Danielle, thank you. And, uh, professor.